Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to The Takeup. Today we have episode 184, Patch Technique Redux, a quick guide to styles and tools. Greetings, everybody. Welcome into this Education Friday, and I am happy to have you here for The Takeup. And today we are trotting well-worn ground. This is something that I cover every six to nine months, if not sooner. And that's just talking about patch styles and the way people make patches, especially what we're talking about today are small run patches or what I often call uh, embroidered edge patches. Why do I call them embroidered edge patches? Uh, because we're talking about patches wherein we do our edging on our embroidery machine. We do them as part of the patch creation process. Not so much post edging, not so much traditional mirroring. We can talk a little bit about that. But the truth of the matter is most of the folks that I'm talking to about patch making are going to be something like me where we're doing small boutique runs of patches and generally we're not doing marrowing on our own. So marrowing, if you don't know, uh, a marrowing machine is very much like a serger, if you might know that, uh, in that it is an overlock machine in which we are overlocking an edge. And it is unlike our interlock machines, which is what we're using for our uh, sewing and for embroidery. So instead of that overlock edge, mostly what we're going to be talking about today is, like I said, uh, embroidered edge patches. What can we do in the hoop on embroidery machines without the process of learning to and honestly having equipment for manual marrowing edges, traditional marrowing? Nothing wrong with traditional marrowing, by the way. Fantastic way to handle patches. Works great for standard shapes that don't have lots of deep insets or cuts or wild, uh, you know, holes through the patches, anything like that that really doesn't work in that situation. But it's great for circles and rounds and squares and arcs and all manner of shapes that are standard and have easy corners. Uh, traditional marrowing is awesome and it's where it's at. And it looks great and it's a, a fantastic look, fantastic way to do patches. It's the classic. And in fact, the fact that we do things like create faux marrowed edges like we have here or in any of the pieces I've shown you for my hat patches lately, as well as, of course, uh, any of the stuff that I showed you from Merrily, that is because the look of traditional marrowing is what we associate with hats. So honestly, nothing wrong with the traditional marrowed patch. But what we're going to talk about a lot today is embroidered edge patches and the various ways in which they're made. Today is not going to be massive groundbreaking. If you're making patches all the time right now, uh, this is, like I said, it's a redux. It's me rehashing the topic a little bit and getting it out there just so people can jump in and know the same terminology when we do talk a little deeper about patch making. And as part of that, I'm also going to show you a little bit of construction probably in software just to let you guys know some things about patch making and to kind of bring that full circle. Because I had lots of questions about people just literally asking me, what are the methods? What is a hot cut patch? What does that mean? What's a soluble substrate? What's water and hot heat soluble? What's the plastic method? What do you, you know, what is that? What are these things? We're going to define those and talk about them a little bit. I'll show you some slides from uh, my understanding emblems class uh, that I teach. And we'll talk just a little bit about patches and, and look at them. Literally, just look at some patches and talk about what they are, how they're put together and make this, like I said, a simple uh, easy introduction to patch making methods, particularly for, like I said, specifically embroidered edge patches, not so much traditional marrowing. That's something that I'm not going to cover much today. Can it get brought up? Absolutely. Cause this is going to be a loose conversational kind of, uh, session. This is not a class that I'm teaching you with a, a strict line of what we're going to go through in the different subjects. We are just going to talk about patch making and make it fun, make it comfortable, make it something we can handle and we can do because it's something I've done a lot of uh, in my career. But I'm going to say this, my method is idiosyncratically mine. It suited the people who I was making patches for. It may not suit your method. There are different ways of doing it. And frankly, I'm going to be honest and say the reason why I consider this small run patch making is once I got up into numbers that would require large runs that were going to be a uh, ponderous to do on my machines or going to take a bunch of handwork. We're up into the hundred plus range. I am generally going to, as a commercial embroiderer, take that to an emblem making company and have that done. That's the honest truth. Uh, I still did lots of digitizing that I sent off to be created into emblems but once we were at more than a hundred pieces at exactly the same thing for a single order, uh, the likelihood is as minimums got smaller and smaller throughout my career, I was probably going to send that off to a patchmaking company. 
This doesn't mean that we didn't still make patches of that very same design in this small run fashion uh, to fill out orders, to do variations, anything else like that. So this is not just me telling you go out and have somebody else do the patches. Quite frankly, me making patches in-house was a massive way that we got involved with uh, TV and filmmaking. And some of the samples that I show when I do Indeed Show samples are from that TV and, and film you know, kind of area. That's really where we got into patches. And it increased our exposure massively and allowed us to do a lot of things. We had lots of high dollar and honestly high margin patches that we did because people were willing to let us and to uh, honestly trust us once they could find out that we did these small run patches. So by all means, I'm not saying send them all out. And in fact, doing the ability to do them in-house for incredibly quick turnarounds, uh, custom treatments and the like, those things were incredibly valuable to the business I was running. But to be honest with you, when you start to ask me about large scale production, once we're over a hundred pieces of the same thing, especially if we're into the hundreds of pieces, the likelihood is, I'll be honest, especially when we're talking about things that were specifically going to be traditional marrowing jobs, we were hiring them out to companies that did emblems all the time in order to get them done. The thing is, the largest number of the orders we had weren't these large patch orders. We actually had tons of these embroidered patch, uh, embroidered edge patch orders that were small, small run orders done in house. And it enabled us to do some other interesting things like um, cover up jobs where we only had a couple pieces that were valuable pieces and we wanted to add something, uh, jobs for sorts of um, accessories that could not take direct embroidery. Back in the first, the first patches I ever made were in order to uh, decorate on golf bags that had no removable po pockets at the time. And the golf bags had internal glued in shells. They could not be embroidered on in post. So I did a faux edge on them, a faux edge stitch, and then glued them down with uh, hardcore adhesives. There are reasons why you might want to use patches, even if you're not doing a mass amount of decorating. And for all of that, the embroidered edge patch is the way to go. Like I said, today is Redux. Today is Techniques. We're going back over some stuff we've gone over before, if you've seen other episodes from me. And I'm taking questions while we do it. So it's really going to be about that. And I'm going to show a couple of things like patches that I've made and showed you, like some of these ones that I do, uh, that I'm going to explain to you the tools that I use to make them uh, as we get time. But like I said, today, Probably not going to uh, break your mind or anything, but we do have a couple of questions. We have people showing up, so I'm going to go ahead and say hi to everybody. Uh, Cindy King says, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Cindy. Thank you for being on. And Doug, yeah, I had a little hiccup. For some reason, the stream yard has been a little stuttery when I got started today, but we're on. <laughs> we're going. And yes, I was just patching things up. You got it. <laughs> I will give you your, your clap for that. I'll shake my head and say, there's your dad joke of the day, even though we're not on the two other guys show that I was on this morning. And uh, Ron says, happy Good Friday. Happy Good Friday, everybody. And like, yeah, notice new hat patch. Yes, that's the cool thing. We've got lots of new hat patches coming. I'm going to be doing this frequently. You're going to be finding me wearing little slogans and stuff that's fun to me. I've got another one that I haven't attached my Velcro yet. You'll be seeing that back soon. That's from a, an upcoming uh, project. I like something. I like very simple pieces like this. I really do. Um, I like slogan pieces. You guys already saw the everyone gets stitches patch. But as you can tell, this is actually the same hat. Why? Because this is a hook and loop hat. There's a lot of hats like these. Oh, I killed my white balance for a minute there. There are lots of these hats like this that have hook and loop pieces. In fact, this one has hook and loop on the top. And I actually have a small hook and loop strap on the back as well that's above the cap arch. There are patches that are out there or patch hats that are made like this that are specific for doing this. In fact, I got, I got these because it lets me swap these in and out and I can do some fun stuff with little patch uh, design pieces just for myself because I, I really liked the idea. But that's one of those things that's interesting, right? It's uh, how do we handle that? How do we handle attachment? We can get into that too a little bit, but you know, suffice it to say, there's a lot to this. I've done entire classes just on how to attach patches to hats uh, <laughs> because it is such a difficult thing. City says, on this case, how did you put your patch on your cap? Like I said, this one is, is hook and loop. It has a big section of loop on it. And what you're going to notice is on this particular piece, you can actually see it because I didn't use good thread for this. I used a bobbin that was going to show. Did this for myself and didn't use something that I would do for a commercial project. This was running at the last minute to get it up for the show. This is just literally a piece of hook that I sewed on manually. I've got a little sewing machine over here to my left and I sewed it on there so I could have it in time for the show when I wanted to wear it. Um, this particular piece, the... Um, 
Velcro was actually put on with the edging like an applique. I put it under the reverse and I ran the edge through the Velcro as a test. Um, that's not something I always do. And I will say that on the machine I was running, it was a little home machine that I decided to do that test on because I wanted to see how much abuse I could put through it. I actually ran it like, a, like an applique. I went ahead and did the design work for this patch was done first. I embroidered that piece with a cut line. So the memento mori and the, and the cut line was embroidered. I cut it out first. Then I used it like applique sandwiched together with that Velcro and I did the edging all last. So placement line, set down my Velcro and my patch, tack down to hold it down and then the Merrow Lee edge. And I did that all on my embroidery machine as one step. So for one piece that you're doing for yourself as a craft project, uh, certainly useful can be done. I would say the hard part about that was that um, maintaining that adherence, I would need some sort of frame or some sort of, um, I've seen people use 3D foam to make a essentially a little holder that holds the stack together until the edge can start. Uh, I've seen people doing that. It's not something I would do for mass production. I'd be much more likely to use some sort of adhesive or to stitch on uh, the Velcro manually or through some other process of holding the patch in place, like I said, with little clamps or some other method in order to do a very simple straight stitch uh, attachment for a pre-cut piece of Velcro. This one was, however, pre-cut Velcro, pre-cut patch with the edge put on as part of that step as a test. A lot of the stuff you'll see me do it, me doing is honestly me stretching the boundaries to see what's possible. Uh, beyond what I'll tell you, I try things that are a little off the beaten path to see what can be done, how it would work if somebody wanted to try it. So that's something that I don't know I would do all the time. But that's how I put the patch on the hat. That is, I, I adhered some uh, hook to the back of this and used an applique-like step to just do the edging after the patch internals were already made. It's one of the ways you can do any of these methods. We talk about um, doing these edges. And sometimes if you're embroidering it all together, we talk about how your edge has to go on last. You do it as one big step. And that's certainly something I've done many times where I do all of the design work, all of the central material at the same time. And I'll go ahead and bring up, since we're talking about this stuff, we'll get right into it. I'll show you very uh, quickly a patch that I'm talking about. This is one of my really oldest samples, but this piece was done that way, right? So this is the Harvest Heroes patch you can see. In fact, I didn't even follow my own orders on this. Uh, we've got that uh, fibrous water soluble material. I've essentially appliqued down pre-cut pieces of twill. You can consider it that way. There was a placement line and then a tack down line. And then I did all of the embroidery on the patch in the center, the wheat, the sickle, all of this was done all together. And then I edged it last. Now, in this case, I would generally edge all three of them last. I didn't. I messed up my sequence on this, but with that water soluble material that looks very much like, uh, like a standard stabilizer, it's fibrous. That stuff holds up to a lot of abuse and a couple layers of that are enough to hold up to the entirety of the embroidery and not tear out. We're gonna talk about that again in a second, but you can do it multiple ways. The other thing you can do though, and it makes it a lot easier, especially for film type methods. Uh, we have film type methods like plastic patch making, and I, I'll show you more of that in a second. We're gonna talk about what that means. When we're working on a film that might tear away, and we have lots of those examples here, this is that water-soluble meth again, but if we look at uh, plastic style films, um, something like we have, I don't think I have a, a picture of that in this piece, but I might not have it sitting here. Unfortunately, I think I accidentally did not bring that up. I've got that in my other set. When we're working on plastic films, they can really tear away quite easily. Um, and when that happens, when we have things tear away from those films, you really do have to be careful about the edges. You can actually do all of that heavy embroidery work that you might do inside of a patch, the design work first, and then you can do the rest of it last. You can just do the edge last. That said, I've done fully embroidered patches on the plastic method without worrying too much about the edging and been okay, provided the material that I was using worked very well. So like I said, it just, it just works pretty well that way. I like to do the embroidery first on some of those really heavy patches that have lots of design work in the middle. And then I cut the patch out like an applique with no edge on it and just do the edging on the plastic substrate last. So that means I've hooped up the plastic or film. It could also be the polyolefin film, uh, like the heat away films, which is a heat away substrate. Run my pl placement line, stick down, adhere down the finished patch that has everything but the edge on it. It's already cut away and you can do any cutting method you want to. That could be hot cut, that could be scissor cut. That could be clinker if you've got that kind of thing, a die cut. It really depends, right? So that that honestly can be any method that you're looking for for that cutting. Just cut to that inner edge. The, the And I'll talk about kind of insets and things in a minute. 
and then set that down, tack it down, either with a zigzag or straight stitch, whatever you prefer for that. I often use a zigzag if I'm doing it manually. And then I run my border, whatever type of border I'm going to do, and only run the border through that film since it tends to perforate more than things like the water soluble. So like I said, there's different methods. I'm going to show you some of them and talk to them more. But let's go ahead and say hi to the last of the fo po folks here, and then we'll go ahead and get into the actual details. <laughs> it's hard for me not to run right into the patches and run right into the details, but I will try and actually give you guys a little bit more of what we're doing here instead of just that. I'm not just going to get run through. The thing is, there are five, six different ways of doing it. The order can be different depending on what you're doing. And even what you use for a patch material or nothing at all, we're going to talk about thread-only patches, can change. We're just going to try and define those pretty quickly, explain to you how they get put together, and give you a little preview of tools. If we want to get super deep on one topic, I'm fully happy to do that. Uh, but we probably won't get to every topic in patches today. I mean, the last time I did this, it was a two-parter. I can imagine this being several parts, especially if we ever get into the point of actually going through some step-by-step -step processes. Like I said, and that just, it really depends. Uh, DJ Kevin asks, uh, what's the largest patch you've done? Um, I've done... <sighs> I've done pretty massive patches. I mean, we've done like 20 inches square pretty easily. Uh, there's really big back patches that I've done. Um, those tend to be a little different. You definitely want some sort of material inside of those or, or some sort of stabilizer to remain instead of doing water soluble for a lot of those really big ones. Um, I don't have all of them queued up. I will just show you real quickly a couple of the larger pieces that are sitting here. I've got, I don't have everything on my, uh, on my deck here, and I'm not going to show everything on this piece because this is a piece where I, I have obscured the name for very good reasons. Uh, but this was one done for a motorcycle club, and this is a pretty, pretty large patch uh, overall. You know, the height on this is probably, I'd say, 15, 16, and then proportionally wide. I'd have to look at it. And then, of course, there are some other bigger pieces. I've got a couple rockers that I think I showed in this piece. This rocker for top notch is another one of those ones where we're talking... 13, 14 inches probably wide, um, but we've done lots of big pieces on those. Uh, back patches are pretty common, and frankly, larger doesn't seem to really be much of a problem unless we're talking about um, trying to do those on like those fine plastic films. I probably wouldn't do that on a big piece of plastic film. That's a lot to do. You can, but on some of these like this also, uh, the material itself was pretty heavy and took a lot of a lot of abuse. This was a, a faux leather. You can say Naga hide, whatever you want to say that is, but it is, it was a faux leather patch. And I've also done some pretty big leather pieces like that. Uh, only thing I'll say is on some of those, I wanted some more stability, especially if I was running uh, a lot of design work in the middle. Like I said, especially when we're talking about things like, um, like I showed you earlier, this piece has a lot of stitching in it. And there are ones that have even further coverage than that too. So it really depends, like I said, but we'll, we'll get further into it. I still want to get to all the different topics that are here, but I'm willing to go ahead and give you a, a quick a quick answer on that while we're saying hi to everybody. We'll say hi to Brian Bailey, by the way, creator of Imbrilliance, and who helped me in, in, in with a lot of the projects I've done recently with ACES. And honestly, um, we worked together on Merrily, and, and Brian coded an incredible engine that does cornering and everything and makes an automatic edge that looks like a marrowed edge, which I'm going to show you some incredible shapes out of. Uh, Charles says, happy Friday. Happy Friday, Charles. Uh, good evening. <laughs> the time has your head in bits. Yeah, we all of our daylight savings causes problems. Sorry about that. Jeremy from uh, Amber Creative says, love me some patches. Absolutely. And he's got his patches that uh, he's doing as well. His product is awesome. They, they do patch producing. Uh, Cindy says, I just recently tried the Ultra Solvi, Solvi 80. Sew the patch, accept the border, then cut out and put on the Ultra, uh, Ultra Solvi for border and punch out. No cleanup. Yeah. That's kind of the plastic method, but it can also be done with soluble uh, soluble films. So we're going to talk about that as well also. Doug says, what fibrous wash away did you use? A list of what you use would be grateful, gratefully helpful. Here's the problem with that. Uh, they're almost all the same. If you were talking about getting fibrous, uh, the fibrous wash away I use, the company that I used for most of my career is no longer in business. I used a thing called uh, Q104. And that was something from Nmart. That's where we used to buy our fibrous wash away from. However, it's very similar to any wash away that has that same fibrous look to it. Um, that's going to be the trade name Vileen is often what you see, but a, a stout fibrous wash away, whatever one you can get a hold of that is, uh, like I said, looks like a stabilizer and has a bit of thickness to it, it's going to be fine. A couple layers of that will hold up to a lot of abuse. 
Um, the truth of the matter is I don't usually use brand names, not because I don't want to give a brand name away. In fact, a lot of what I also use is Madeira products. And I offer, I walk, talk about the EZ line of products from Madeira, but there aren't that many manufacturers of the base material in the stabilizers. So if you go find a wash away that looks fibrous, you're probably on the right track. It's just what I'm going to say. <laughs> because honestly, there aren't that many producers of the materials and lots of little different companies sell put-ups of those same materials. So just to say that, the, the fibrous wash away, look for a wash away that looks like a cutaway stabilizer. You're pretty happy. I mean, that's what you're looking for. Anyway, lots more people coming up. Uh, Cindy says, Eric's taught us many different ways. Absolutely. Love the subject today, Susan says. I, I do too. So I'm going to talk about a lot of that. Uh, Jan says, Any, uh, anyone use an electronic cutter to cut the poly tool patch shapes? This guy. A lot of mine were done on an electronic cutter. And frankly, they're done with a drag knife. So that's like the traditional cutters. Uh, I was using a Roland Cam 1 for years. I've used a Graph Tech cutter. Brand's not important because I've also cut them on a Sizzix. I've known people who cut them on crickets. Uh, any sort of drag knife cutter. And for me, it was like a 60 degree blade. Uh, pretty easy stuff. So 60 degree blade on a standard knife cutter uh, with roll fed materials. I used Stahl's PS Poly Twill, but Stahl's PS Poly Twill is also very shiny. Once I started using cutters that had what I, I always kind of joke around and call it the glue trap which is the, a, a sheet, an adhesive sheet that goes through them like the modern uh, craft cutters do. Then I used lots of just off-the-shelf polyester twills that didn't have backings to them. When I first started doing this, though, uh, roll-fed was just the easiest way for me to handle it, and the one roll-fed twill I could get reliably was Stahl's uh, pressure-sensitive poly twill. That and the great thing about uh, the Stahl's PS poly twill, and I'll show you again that patch thing I was showing you, um, just to make it clear, Stahl's PS Poly Twill is this one. Uh, these patches are made with it. There's several patches I've done. This one's made with it as well. It's the standard classic kind of tackle twill that you might expect for numbers and letters. It is fairly shiny. Um, a lot of my pieces, this one is not. See, that's one that's made with a standard twill. And this is a standard patch twill from a man manufacturer, though I made the original version of this one uh, and in my own shop when we first did sampling. However, this was done by a patch manufacturer and heat cut. However, the thing is, you can see that's not very shiny, whereas the stall stuff, not everybody loves it because it does have a fairly high sheen to it. If you don't like shine, uh, lots of folks will put a, a percentage of fill over it to knock it down. The great stuff about the PS Poly Twill is it has a little bit of adhesive on it and you stick it down like stickers. When you're putting down your material, if you're worried about it shifting, uh, it sticks like a sticker. You press it down against the uh, stabilizer and it holds long enough for you to get your tack down done. The only problem with it is I have heard people say, and I haven't had as much trouble with it. Once again, here's another one, very shiny, but it's a lovely, lovely uh, final product, but it is, it is shiny. You can see the shine on that black. Um, the only thing is on some dark colors, people will complain of a haze of little white snowy elements coming out of it. And what that is, is the adhesive coming up with the needle will sometimes make a haze of white. It brushes off, it rolls off with a lint roller. If you heat press it, it usually disappears, but it does actually do that sometimes. And I, the funny thing is I'll say from batch to batch, I notice it being different. It wasn't the same all the time, but if you use something that has a heat adhesive already applied to it like that does, or a pressure sensitive adhesive, you can get a little needle stickiness. You can get snow on your black and navy and dark colors sometimes. And that that can be a drawback. I'm fully willing to say that. However, for us, the ability to pre-cut my shapes in a way that was very easy to stick down and run uh, was worthwhile to me. And especially for the clients who didn't mind there being a little bit of shine to the pieces. But like I said, we got a lot, a lot of people still going. So yeah, we got other people talking about it. Uh, Cindy says she got tired of the water soluble. Yeah. I liked it because for me, uh, once again, it's a trade-off. If you do the tear, the tearaway edge, sometimes you will still see plastic. In fact, this one hasn't been cleaned up, and I wonder if you can see it. I think you can. If I get the camera to focus on it just right, you can see that there's some roughness. There's actually some little pigs. Oh, I dropped out my green screen when I did that. <laughs> Sorry, folks. But yeah, there's a little bit of my, my camera is acting up. The newest driver is a little weird. But you can see these little tiny picks of plastic sticking out. Uh, sometimes when you do the plastic method, even on really nice heat away, you still have to apply heat to get it to clean up. Um, but yeah, otherwise, for me, 
uh, fully rinsing them out and leaving them to dry. The time for them to dry wasn't a problem for me. And I wanted them to be very, very uh, pliable. That's not something a lot of people always want. Many people want very stiff patches. For the stuff that I was doing, I wanted them to be very pliable. They were being sewn onto a wardrobe and they needed to be look like they had been worn or at least like they weren't brand new. Everything couldn't look brand new. And for sewing them on, on uh, costuming, it made a lot of sense to have all of the stabilizer gone and for them to look a little worn in. For that reason, washing them away and letting them dry was good. The trade-off is, you're right, uh, when you wash them out, you have to wash them out completely and they have to dry before you're selling them. You have to dry and sometimes get pressed. But yeah, that is that is part of why wash away might be a, a kind of a down thing, but that's the thing. And Cindy says, I've used heavy gauge clear vinyl. Works great for that last step. Once again, though, that's like this method here. This is That is that same kind of heavy gauge vinyl style. You often get little tiny picks or teeth on the edge. Uh, that can cause some issues. So yeah, for sure, there can be issues with that where the, the edge cleanliness is not as good. And that's kind of the thing to work with. But, but Jan says, I've used a lot of Eric's tips. I love patches. I don't like hats. Yeah, some people like to do patches on hats better. But you never know, right? But let's get into the actual topic, right? I want to get to the actual topic of what we're going on. Uh, a lot of this is going to be from my understanding emblems class that I've done before. But in general, I just want to let you know, we're talking embroidered edge patches here. Let's talk about the different methods. And let's just kind of go through them and talk some pros and cons and, and discuss them just a little bit. With the first method being the one I probably use the least, which is the hot cut method, right? So let me go ahead and get, I'm going to bring this stuff up. We're going to talk about emblems and execution, how we actually make these things happen. And so I'm actually going to give you some slides. So this is like being in one of my classes for free. <laughs> But the thing is, we're going to be a little less structured. Obviously, I answered lots of questions before we ever got to this stuff. But we're going to talk about emblems of execution. You can see really close here. This is me working on the water soluble and cutting away some excess on that Harvest Heroes patch. But there's multiple ways we can handle this. And I think it's worthwhile talking about it. But the heat cutting or hot knife method, uh, honestly, the big thing to remember with this is that you're just sewing the entire patch onto a piece of material. And the, this piece is just a swatch. Uh, I did this for, for a TV show, Alpert Automotive. Um, it's not for an actual company, it's for a show, but this is a swatch piece that needs its edge cut away. Usually you're actually doing an entire span. And in that case, like you have a large span of material often on a sash frame where we're going to sew tons of these patches all at once. P pros and cons for this one. Um, really, the pros and cons are, are, are pretty simple. You're sewing everything all at once. You don't have to do any additional prep. There's no pre-cutting that has to happen. Uh, but the cons on that obviously are that you're going to have to use a careful hand to avoid spoilage. So let's go through them really quickly. Um, heat cutting, there's much less specialty digitizing. I'm not having to put the applique style steps that we're going to talk about when we talk about soluble materials where you're adding on the material after the fact, you're having to do a placement line, you're having to stop and tack things down. There might be movement, there might be adhesion that has to be done. You don't have to do pre-cutting. You don't have to stop during machine operation. The edges are sealed against fraying. Uh, I mean, that should be covered to a degree in any patch by the edge stitching covering that up. And you can cut all patch layers at once. And what that means is um, if you care to do it this way, I've known people who do it both ways where they, they put their heat press material on after the fact. I've also seen people put the heat adhesive on before they do the hot knife cutting. You can put all your stacks together of like, if you want crinoline underneath it, you can put that together before you put your edge on. If you want adhesive, you can put that on sometimes all in one big stack and press that stack before you cut. Uh, people have different methods. I generally don't like to do that, but people do. And then you use that hot knife to cut all the layers. So hot knife, by the way, just to make it patently clear, the hot knife most people sell is a wood burning pen. A temperature controlled one is better. But the thing is, you really can spoil very easily. The last hot knife cutting I did, and recently, uh, I melted a piece of my patch. I was messing around. I thought, oh, I'm going to mess around with that hot knife. And I went and got the hot knife out, uh, went to go cut a piece of the patch. And I absolutely, in fact, it's not over here. I don't have the piece that I killed. I absolutely dinged the border. Um, if you don't move quickly, if you're not paying attention, if your hot knife is too hot. I used a new uh, hot knife, wood burning pen that I hadn't used before. Um, and it was a little too hot. It wasn't a controllable piece. And I thought it'd be about the same as the one that I'd been using previously. And it was not, it was hotter than I was used to melted very quickly. And it changed the kind of speed I had to use in doing the cut. Uh, it's relatively time consuming. If you have complicated shapes, uh, I mean, this is going to take you some time and it can leave a little bit of a visible base material. And in fact, I'm going to go ahead and go back to our, our pieces here. And I'll say even on commercial hot cut, which is done very well at those patch cutting companies. If I zoom in real tight, you do see a little haze, a little edge of that base material. 
Is that super critical? No, not necessarily. But this is from a company that does nothing but make patches all day and very likely used um, some automated method to do this, which may or may not also be uh, something that can also be done, which is a uh, post cutting with a laser. So post edging laser cutting can be done as well, where someone will, will do the patch after the fact of the laser, they have a drawn out edge and they use a laser to cut out around that patch, sometimes with computer vision, sometimes not. But there's almost always, you just see this little haze of the edge color. And if that color is a really stark contrast, like let's say you're doing safety green with black edges, sometimes you will see a little haze of that safety green on the outside edge and it doesn't look awesome. So it just depends on your tolerance for that, uh, whether that's an issue for you. But that's your pros and cons for hot cut. Um, for my money, uh, hot cutting is just not my favorite way to do it, especially if it's something where I have the time to either do the wash away or I'm going to take a moment to do the, uh, the the tear out method, the punch out method with plastic, even if I have to clean up the edges. What I am going to say, though, is even when I've talked to folks who do um, patch production commercially where they do a uh, post cut with lasers, even that doesn't always hit perfectly sometimes and they clean things up by hand, which often means uh, taking like a hot knife tool or some other heat tool and cleaning up the edges uh, the very same way that you would do it with hot cutting. And in fact, that's something you'll often see a hot cutter do is they will cut with the blade like this and then hold up their heat burning pen vertically. And on the barrel of the pen, they'll run the edge of the patch around to get a nice clean edge on it. Um, it's not impossible. People who do a really good job of it can do a great job. They can get good at it, but it takes practice. And not only does it take some practice, um, you can still spoil. And I find that I get scorch on light materials too often. It's a little too easy to scorch a white thread or a white material with this stuff. Um, I it, it really can depend on the material, what kind of stuff will, will scorch. And if you ever want to use material that is not a plastic, that does not melt, if you don't want to use polyester for some reason, you want to do a cotton patch, you want to do some other specialty material, Hot knife is out. This has to be done on something that will melt. So like I said, a nylon, a, a polyester is the classic. But then you also have to remember if you run your edge with polyester thread and you have a polyester patch, of course, you have a good chance of cutting into the thread. Um, it's made out of the same material and threads are thinner and less resistant than the material itself to some degree. You have to be very careful. And in fact, I have known hot knife cutters who preferentially will use rayon thread for their edge on their patches because it's a slightly different uh, temperature gradient. It doesn't melt the way that polyester melts. But then we have all of the complications of rayon thread, rayon thread being a little less um, able to hold up to abrasion and definitely not able to hold up to like bleaching. So if it's going to be anywhere commercial or uniforming, I don't know that you want to use a ton of rayon thread. Trust trust me, someone who knows who's had a rayon red thread bleed on a white doctor's coat before when it gets industrial laundry, because one of my operators decided that all red was just red and didn't check what cones they put up. You don't want that to happen, right? So you don't want your rayon thread bleeding onto your, you know, your polyester coat either. That's the other problem about that. So it's it's a little hard. And yeah, Cindy, Cindy says this too. I didn't like the burn on white fabrics. Yeah, it's too easy for that to happen. So for me, uh, the spoilage risk is usually something I wasn't worth wasn't worth doing. And frankly, for a lot of my work, I didn't want multiple layers or anything where the hot knife was giving me a massive benefit. So I wasn't putting a lot of crinoline inside to make them harder, stiffer. I wasn't doing a lot of um, preheat sealing. And honestly, many of the patches I did were either like this one stitched down to a hook for hook and loop application or stitched directly. Either we were stitching them on or uh, a costuming department was stitching them on, or whoever was working on them, even uniform people were stitching them on directly. So the level of stiffness to the patch wasn't that important, and hot cutting a massive stack wasn't going to be a big deal to me. That may vary for you. I mean, one of the guys I taught patch making very early on, the very first thing he said to me when I taught him my methods was like, uh, the people who I, I'm selling to, they absolutely want a stiff patch like cardboard. And eventually he settled on uh, working with layers of crinoline or buckram underneath the patch before they did this edging. And he often, you can sew right through the crinoline. Now there are patch fabrics that actually have a bound, like there's buckram fused to the back of the patch material before you start. Um, sometimes that can cause some needle deflection with small detail, but it does give a nice stiff patch. And there are, when you heat seal on either heat adhesive or heat seal material, which does is not an adhesive, but does adhere to the patch and adds an extra plastic layer on it, you can make it stiffer if that's what you want. 
Um, people who sell uh, card style uh, souvenir style patches will often want a stiffer patch. But for me, it wasn't a big deal. Like I said, that's hot cutting. That's one of the, the things I usually hear is what's a hot knife? How do I do hot cutting? That's what hot cutting is. You literally take yourself a piece of glass, you throw your span of patches on it or your cutout patch with extra material on it, and you run that blade right up against the border that you created on your patch to make it happen. But like I said, it's pretty much a satin border, sometimes with extra reinforcement. I can show you a reinforced border in a minute to explain what I'm talking about. It's essentially an extra dense doubled satin border that just gives you more edge to cut against. Uh, it's just more of a reinforced edge that's a little built up. But mostly there's not a lot of specialty digitizing. It's pretty much a design that has a border around the edge so you can cut against it. And so honestly, that's the other reason people love hot knife cutting is like there's not a lot of specialty work that has to be done. Um, much easier than, than at least soluble methods. So let's talk about the soluble stabilizer method for a moment, right? So when we talk about soluble substrate or soluble stabilizers, Soluble means it dissolves for one in one weapon or another. Generally, a lot of the stuff you've seen me talk about, I do show a lot of water soluble. It's one of my favorite ways because it leaves absolutely nothing to the edge. I'm never manually cleaning up an edge. I rinse it out as hard as I can. I throw it somewhere to dry and get flat and it's done. There's no cleanup at the end of it aside from the washing. But I don't, I'm not manually trimming. I'm not using a hot knife. I'm not using the barrel of the knife. I'm not you know, heat gunning the edges carefully. It can be done and kind of, it's a set it and forget it method, but it requires uh, rinsing carefully and literally getting them fully wet and letting them dry out fully. And that can be a pain for a lot of folks. So that's water soluble. The thing is there are also heat soluble materials uh, and they either completely melt to some degree, they melt away, they shrivel up, or uh, they will, the edges will melt in after you do tear away very much like the plastic method. And I'll talk about the plastic method in a moment. It's slightly different, but there are heat soluble materials where we treat them a little bit more like we do the other soluble stabilizers and that we, we intend them to go away entirely. Whereas some of the plastics, even though you might use heat to shrink them, they don't go away. Heat soluble will brush away after it melts. You can shrivel it down and get rid of it. Whereas full-on heavy gauge plastics, they remain. They are inside of the patch forever. Uh, and at the edge, they tear away cleanly and might melt down a little bit, but the inside of the body of the patch, behind the patch, they aren't very removable, or at the very least, they are um, they are not coming out with heat. They are not being ushered away any other way, but physically tearing them out. So a slightly different step, but let's talk about the soluble substrates for a moment, and I'll just kind of run you through it very quickly and give you some pros and cons as I did previously. So soluble stabilizers, we're gonna place it like an applique. And you're gonna hear me say this repeatedly even when we talk about digitizing. Patches and appliques are very similar. Pre-cut material that we put a placement line, we tack it down and then we put down an edge. Um, you can do less or more edging on an applique because it's direct depending on how it's cut, but it's a very similar process. And in fact, when you look at some people's patch tools in software, it's essentially a glorified applique tool aside from a little bit of tweaking to settings. And you can use the same mentality you have for creating applique to create patches. However, there's some certain specialties to it. The thing to remember though is it's a very similar process. And what changes instead of being direct to a garment, we're going on to some sort of material, some substrate, whether it's soluble or tears away, where we're getting rid of that background material. That's kind of the difference between patches and applique, aside from the fact that patches almost always have a fully covered edge, whereas you will see appliques, especially if they are laser cut, hot cut, appliques that have just a, a light zigzag around them and they reveal more of that edge. That kind of classic tackle tool with a big open zigzag where the edge of the patches or the edge of the applique is not entirely covered is not, of course, going to be happening with most patches. Patches, people are not looking for an open edge on them. They want a bordered edge generally on a patch before they're using it. Uh, so that's the big difference is that it very much is always a solid edge. But if you look at a solid satin covered edge applique and a patch, the differences are fairly minimal. It's more about what you're sewing them on and what happens to it after the fact. Is it a garment that's going to be remaining there forever? Or is it, uh, you know, something that we're trying to get rid of? It's like a substrate, like a soluble substrate. Let's talk about the soluble substrates. Uh, we're placing patch material, stitching it like an applique on something soluble that melts away entirely after the treatment to get our finished edge. That's how we're getting our edge cleanliness. In this case, uh, we're looking at water soluble, but it could be in any other, you know, soluble method would be fine with this. 
you will put a placement line down, you stick down your base patch material. In this case, we're looking at a PS poly twill. It's a polyester twill like most of the patches I do. Either as pre-cuts or as a raw material, and you can hand cut. There is nothing telling you you can't hand cut with the soluble method. You would, instead of running this zigzag tack down or any other tack down line, you would just run a cut line on top of, of your span. You run a placement line, throw down your big piece of material, make sure it's nice and flat, run a cut line and then cut around it very carefully. You can do it that way. Uh, my way was often using pre-cuts with digital cutting equipment. In this case, like I said, regular drag knife cutter. So anything like a vinyl cutter will do. Um, and that's, that's pretty much the only difference with that part of the process. Other than that, we are putting down pieces, what is pre-cut or raw, then we are tacking them down with a tack down stitch. And at the end, we are covering that edge. We're doing a full satin edge. And the great thing is when we're done, we're rinsing it away. If it's if it's uh, water soluble, if it's heat away stabilizer, we're generally tearing it out. We're popping out of that heat away film. And then we're applying heat, whether that's you know using a heat gun, whether that's using a heat press, whatever we are, we're applying heat and it gets rid of the rest of it. And uh, depending on your thickness and how it maintains itself, how it works, uh, you brush it away, you rub it away, and, and that material goes away. Um, but in this case, the pros on this stuff, complete clean edge coverage because we have we have a little bit of a reveal between that cut material and the edge just like you would for an applique there's a little bit of inset and when we rinse it away especially with the solubles you, there's no skill involved in this edge coming out nicely you put enough water on this stuff or you pre-soak it and spray it out really well until it stops foaming and this stuff is gone it melts away entirely down the drain it goes uh, either that or if we're using the heat away method, we tear it out. And if there's a little bit of, you know, edge quality issues, we hit it with some heat and it goes away. So we don't really have to trace any edges. We're not rubbing or treating or working on those edges at all. We're just letting it go. It's done. Um, doesn't rely on skill. So there's potentially less manual labor. But of course, there's still cons with this, especially the water soluble. Um, it does require quote unquote require specialty digitizing. All that means that we do have to think about our order. We have to think about how things are put together. And certainly you do want to do your edges last on most of these materials, not as important on the water soluble that looks like a fibrous material, much more important on films. Uh, but you do have to essentially treat it like an applique. You do have to do that. Whereas honestly, on a hot cut patch, you could use a standard satin border and it'd be fine. Um, yes, I'm going to show you the reinforced border, but you could use a standard satin border if you wanted to. It's really efficient with pre-cut pieces like I showed you, but it, it really often involves rinsing and drying if you're doing water soluble, might involve pressing or heating if you're using heat soluble. And like I said, heat soluble stabilizers, in this case, um, thick heat soluble badge films. This is the easy badge film from Madeira. If you want to know what specifically is, this is a polyolefin film, but it, it's very much like a plastic film in the fact that it tears a little more easily and you have to be careful about perforating the edge before you're done. And in fact, though lots of people will tell you one sheet will do it, even if you look at the um, style sheets and or the guide sheets from Madeira themselves, they recommend for any sort of heavy embroidery that's being directly done through it. So let's say we are going to stitch all of our material that's going inside of the patch, whatever designs and fills and everything that might be inside of our patch, are going to be stitched through this material, they're expecting to use two sheets. So do, do realize that even those folks are going to expect a little bit more of that material to hold up to it. So this is, like I said, polyolefin film, but it does heat away. You tear it away when you're done and you heat away the excess and it goes away. Um, however, like I said, it's a little less forgiving than say the water soluble substrates. The water soluble is like this. They so like stabilizer. They really don't tear away that easily and you can abuse them. So it means that there's no watching on the machine. I don't have to do two placements. Like if we're talking about the, the stuff we talked about earlier with Cindy where she did and where I showed you that piece where I had done just the edging. This piece was done that way where just the edging was done last on a plastic substrate. That doesn't have to be done with those sort of materials like this. You don't really have to worry quite as much. Whereas on uh, these types of pieces, you generally don't want to do your edging first and then do a bunch of work inside of the patch because you're going to perforate your edge. And then as you work on the inside, the material of the patch, you're going to tear away the edge. You might cause failure in the patch as it perforates and rips away. So like I said, plastic substrate is, it's very similar to working on this kind of material, but it's with a material that doesn't necessarily heat all the way. You're hooping it on a plastic substrate from which the uh, finished patch is torn. So when you hear the plastic method, that's using a plastic substrate. 
Um, it can be a commercial patch plastic. Uh, whether we're talking about the heat away stuff's not quite the same because it really is meant to go away more than this kind of plastic. But if someone talks about like the Madeira MFS system, which has some plastic that they sell for it, or anytime you hear somebody say, oh, I use plastic from the fabric store. I use tablecloth plastic. I use heavy gauge vinyl. That's this. That's the plastic substrate. As you can see, you can do a fully covered piece out of it. And there's a very small patch, but I ran this fully covered piece, boarded it last and pull it out with a little teeny satin border on it that held up. Now it's well tucked onto the rest of the fill materials inside of that small Valkyrie patch that I made, but you can do full covered patches on plastic. It's kind of why I put this here is that people sometimes say, oh, well, the plastic, you have to be super careful. Yes, you do. But if you're careful not to perforate until you get to the outside edge, you can put a fair amount of uh, detail, fair amount of fill into a plastic patch and come out okay. That's a single layer of that heavy gauge plastic in this particular uh, case. Does that always happen? No. And the problem I have is many times when people say they're using the plastic method, they may be using anything from tablecloth, plastic and vinyl out to dry cleaning bags, out to any manner of plastic thing they can get under their machine. They don't all behave the same way. Chemically, I don't even want to ch tackle the idea of melting some of these different things. They may not all be as safe as others. If you start using heat to clean up the edges or lighters or the hot pen to get that edge cleanliness that you want. And I cannot swear when someone comes to me with ever, whatever random material they're using that it's going to work the same way. It's why you'll often see me kind of recommend to use things like the Madeira Soluble instead because it punches out the same way. But it's something you can purchase and you know it's going to work the same way every time. Or to at least be really aware of the gauge of plastic using and test it first. Because if, if you're just getting whatever random bag or like I said, dry cleaning bag or you know, mattress protector or whatever weird thing, I've heard a million weird things being used for the plastic method. Do many of them work? Yes. Um, they may not work the same way every time. And so that's the thing that kind of gives me a little bit of pause. They may not work the same way every time and you may not have the same characteristics as somebody else. So do test and do be careful what you're doing. And like I said, very often with this plastic method, you want to run your edges last to make sure you don't perforate. But yeah, you sew the entire patch on it. And like I said, here is a commercial system. This is the Madeira MFS system. It actually has a captured frame that holds in that plastic. Uh, and that works very well for that. Um, this can use either of those methods that I talked about either applicating the method or we can talk about the thread only patch. Um, thread only patch works very well with, uh, with plastic method because the plastic remains inside and it gives us some extra body. I have made thread only patches. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. You make them with uh, embroidered fills. They're made entirely out of thread. I have made them on water soluble and they do hold together. They don't just come apart after you're done stitching them very much like lace doesn't come apart after you stitch it because there's some structure there. But if you want some thickness to it, um, having plastic substrate, the stuff that does not heat away or wash away can give it more body. And so that's where you see this used for thread only patches, though I am going to tell you for sure. Um, Madeira recommends using the thread only method on their soluble polyolefin and I've used it too and it's fine. But I do see more people using plastic style substrates with the thread only patch. And I'll show you that again in a second. Uh, but this method, you can do applique method, which we're using the material like the polyester, or we can use the thread only method. And like I said, even though these commercial solutions do exist, people definitely use like 20 gauge clear vinyl uh, and any manner, like I said, all these other manners of bags and things. I'm not going to recommend that because I want it to be something a little more controllable. I would at least love to see people going to get similar products from fabric stores or big box stores. So at least, you know, whenever you go back to get that material again, it's going to operate in the same fashion. It's going to stretch the same way. It's going to tear the same way. It doesn't necessarily mean you can't use dry cleaning bags. What I'm going to say is I haven't. And if you ask me for tips, I may not know how many layers of dry cleaning bag you need to make that work out. For me, single layer of the 20, uh, the 20 gauge clear, the regular table, like I said, tablecloth vinyl has worked well enough, just as well as the commercial version. And like I said, it does work well. It tears away after you're done. You run your edges last as much as you can. And when you tear it out, you pop it out. Usually the edge looks pretty clear, especially with clear plastic. You don't see the edge. There can be these little teeth or little points that stick out and heat will sometimes be used to clean those up. Many people will use a hot knife and rub it around the edge. Some people swear by using heat guns. I have seen some rippling and things that doesn't always work great on all plastics. 
but they look pretty good. Like the edges look pretty clear. They're not always perfect, especially in sharp corners. You'll feel little points, but they're not terrible and they look pretty good. They're not uh, as clean as a soluble substrate edge is going to get, but they do have some body to them and they do tear out pretty easily. And what I'm going to show you here too, we're looking at these two patches. These were actually both done on different systems. Those two San Antonio police patches, and this was actually done for a, a TV show. It was done for um, the night shift that was on NBC for a while. One of them was commercial solution. One of them was, was done on the patch or the um, plastic material directly out of the big box store. There was almost no difference to them and the operation really didn't make any big difference to me at all. So frankly, I wouldn't say that you can't. You absolutely can use off-the-shelf materials for this to work. These are also both thread-only patches that you're looking at, and I'm going to show you the method later. Um, I did this because we had to have a particular olive drab that was hard to source the first time I did it. I actually sublimated my own twill just to get the color correct. And then later on, because I had more machine time than I had time to run around sublimating and matching colors, they picked a thread color they loved that we were already using for other other uh, subdued patches. And I used thread to make the patch, which is something I'm going to show you in a minute. But this is plastic substrate. This is where we stitch it all down. Very similar in the methods. We make sure our edges are last on this for sure, because we're going to have, have a lot more likelihood with these plastic films to tear out as we perforate those edges. A hole in plastic is a hole forever. A hole in a fibrous water soluble, the fibers might rearrange a little bit and still hold on. But a hole in plastic is like leather. Uh, aside from the fact there really isn't any, there's fibrous structure in leather. A hole in plastic is just a hole. It's going to tear very easily. Plastic films tear easily when they're perforated. So we do have to watch out for stacking all of the holes like we have on a patch edge and making a perforated line that's easy to tear. What makes them easy to tear out when we're finished also makes them easy to tear while they're running. So we want to make sure we don't have any straight lines or edges as we get until we get out to that final border. Like I said, interesting stuff that we can do. Pros for it, easy finishing. The clear material is fairly forgiving. We can do those thread-based emblems like I showed you in any color. And the other thing we can do is use that applique method. And that's where we essentially, we put that down. We sew this on. We sew the final border on for performance wear to keep the performance wear looking good. But that's for almost any patch. Um, those commercial systems have a way to hoop underneath that film. The MFS system that I showed you earlier, it actually has a secondary hoop that pops under that so that we can make the patch essentially. And then we can do the edge last on a garment and have this really fully sewn piece that's not through a piece of performance wear. So it causes much less rippling when you just do the edge. So it's just an interesting thing we could do, but it's not something that's really about patch making. That's why I put an asterisk on it. Cons on it, requires a specialty digitizing. You do have to, especially the thread-based method, you have to know what you're doing unless you have tools. Uh, Merrily has an automated method to make a thread-based patch, but that didn't exist at the time when I first taught this. Um, and the, the emblems can be pretty thin, uh, if you use the commercial solution, that plastic's pretty thin and pliable. And if you don't like that, especially with the thread-based method, it's pretty pliable, pretty thin. You might have to apply some support materials to make it uh, a little stiffer, a little uh, more, have a little more body. And like I said, increase potential for tearing out. Looking at the image that's here, it's one that I teach with a lot. The very first time I sampled this, I was not exactly careful about my instructions, or at the very least, I followed the instructions I was given to the letter uh, not noticing that they had missed a decimal point position on one of the stitch links. And I perforated the edge early. And you can see, though it's even more perforation than you might get, I mean, it's not really more perforation than a satin edge. You see on the right-hand side of that image, and I'll go ahead and kind of circle it here. Right-hand side of that, you see how it's pulling away and there's all this haze that's going on. It's pulling out. It's already starting to tear in about like 15 seconds or after this, this picture is taken, when I start running again, um, this piece starts tearing out, bundles up, and rips into the center of the thing. Um, this entire edge gives way. If you pre-perforate that edge too much, you can absolutely tear that out of any of these films. It's the same with water-soluble that looks like plastic, the Badge Master films. Um, if you do a lot of work in those after you perforate the edge, it's really highly likely to tear that edge away early. And that can be something you don't like. So those are, that's a big con for plastic substrates. So we're going to talk a little bit in a second about some digitizing stuff. But for right now, let me stop and get some questions uh, and just kind of go back through it. So the, the stuff we talked about earlier today, as far as all the types of embroidery edged patches, the embroidered edge patches we can do, hot cut, we go through an entire span, we hoop an entire piece of fabric 
that has to be something that melts under the hot knife. So polyester, it can be with our stabilizer involved. It's going to have stabilizer and polyester in it. So we can even use standard uh, stabilizers for this. You can use a cutaway stabilizer in this thing. It's going to make nice stiff patches. We run the entire design, not a lot of digitizing involved. It has a border on it. We cut it out with the edge. No problem. It, however, does require us to use a hot knife and we can ruin the patch pretty easily. Um, if you're someone who has a laser system, you can program the edge into it and line it up, depending if you have computer vision or not, you know, if it's going to help you with alignment or not. And you can cut the shape afterwards with a laser. Um, there's still usually some manual cleanup to be done. Soluble substrates. We can essentially use them like appliques. So we put down a placement line, we put down a tack down, and then we have our border on the outside edge that we run last after everything else is run. Or we can, like I said, make patch blanks that we cut out. So it's got all of the material inside of it that's sewn. So all the design is sewn and we just cut out the patch and then we only edge it on the soluble substrate. Either of these can be done. But in the end, what we have is an edge that we're going to get rid of the material behind it. So if it's water soluble, we're rinsing it out and we get a nice clean edge. If it's heat soluble, we're tearing it away from that material and then we're heating it and we're brushing away the last little bits of the heat soluble material. And that's essentially going to give us the clean edge because we're removing the material that would have been at the edge. That's how we're getting our edge cleanliness. Plastic method, we essentially do it once again, very much in that same uh, applique style. If we want to use fabric, we can also do a thread based patch, which I'll talk about in a minute. But there's a reason they sometimes call these punch out patches because we essentially punch them out of that plastic material and rip the edges away. We may have to clean them up with a little bit of heat. But the one thing to remember on plastic or on any kind of film looking stabilizer, we have to watch out for perforation around the edges and very likely run our edges last for most of those, especially if we are going to do all of the embroidery at the same time. If we're doing a bunch of heavy fills and satins and things inside of that patch, as well as the outside edge, then we want to make sure, especially then, to run our edges last so we don't perforate before we put all that stress on that stabilizing material or on that, uh, so that sacrificial substrate, which both the plastic and the wash away is. So let's go ahead and go to the comments for a second. I think we've gotten some of those things going on for those. Uh, hopefully we've gotten some, some things out of the way for folks. Uh, Brent says hello. Hi, Brent. <laughs> Melanie says no heat application for applying, right? Uh, for so only depends on some of these. Any of these can be heat applied. Plastic method can be heat applied. The heat doesn't necessarily warp it. I've seen people over, um, you can melt anything if you overheat it, but um, lots of people use the plastic method and then apply heat uh, stabilizers to or heat um, adhesives to them. Uh, for my money, you can do that with any of them. I did that with my water solubles because once they were dry, I can absolutely apply a heat adhesive to those. That's no problem with that. Um, hot cut might be a little easier because some people like to, like I said, pre-press the heat adhesive sheet onto the piece before it's cut. And then they cut through all the layers of what they put together with that hot knife all at once. So you can definitely do that with almost any of those. Um, and that's usually pretty good. Cindy says, how do you keep your patch from having wrinkles when you're just putting something like text on your tool with a border? Um, that can be tough. I mean, a lot of it is how you're setting up your text. Certainly, really heavy satin stitches on a loose polyester twill, you're probably going to want to adhere that twill down because if you're not doing it as a span, if it doesn't have anything holding the edges, especially when you do pre-cuts, it can start to pull. There's just some reality to that. That said, um, I put pretty big satin stitches and wide satins on things and I don't get a lot of, dis of uh, disruption. But for me, it's, it's, about, um, it's a lot about making sure I have my density controlled Lots of people are putting way the heck too much density in their satin stitch text. And so they're getting extra warping there. Um, also, it depends on the stabilizer underneath. If you're using a stabilizer or a substrate that doesn't hold up to that stitching, which a lot of people do, they put, if you're putting just a really loose, fairly pliable uh, polyester pre-cut thing right down onto the film style pieces and then running embroidery on top of it, we have to realize there's not a lot to hold back that that uh, pull comp. So sometimes I like to do the thing that, that you discussed earlier and that I talked about as one of the sample methods is to go ahead and um, stitch everything out as a span, cut it out. So I have stabilizer in that stack. Because when I'm stitching it on a span, it's very much like hot cut. I'm putting stabilizer and uh, polyester down and then I'm cutting my patch before I edge it. And then that all goes into my edge on my substrate and it doesn't cause the same trouble. Though I am going to say, if you have loose twill that is not adhered, 
So a little bit of spray tack, embroidery specific spray tack can make a big difference to this. Stick it down to your stabilizer instead of just laying the twill on top. Uh, that can help. Otherwise, hoop the entire span, pre-cut it if you're seeing a lot of difficulty with that. And also the same things apply to uh, patches as any other material, especially with loose materials. If you run, if you run something on an edge, like if I ran this M and then went to the I and ran toward the M, I'm going to make a, a ripple just like I would any other time. If you're seeing a ton of rippling, that kind of distortion, then the sequence of your letters can matter too. It really depends. Um, so yeah, it depends on that. And then you said, uh, it's more when you apply the heat sensitive seal that gives the wrinkles. Yeah, I don't know. That That's something where it depends on your material. I haven't had a lot of trouble with that, to be frank. Um, I would certainly make sure that your, your material that you're using, your heat press and the material you're using all holds up to that heat the right way. That might be something where you might want to talk to your, um, the person who provides your heat seal and see if you could use um, lower temps, make sure your pressure's right and see about the process on that. I don't know. Yeah. If you've got something that's shrinking, yeah, sometimes that can be an, an issue for sure. And then um, we've got a couple things. Uh, Mike says, Plastic is my go-to for most patches. Yeah, a lot of people like it. Uh, and I've known people who make tons of patches and they really do everything on plastic. And like I said, it's not my favorite all the time, but it does it does do the job, you know, decently well. Um, if something's going to be really zoomed in, it really depends. But yeah, I think um, certainly plastic is a good method. There's nothing wrong with the plastic method at all, uh, unless you just don't like the plastic method. I really have enjoyed, I know I showed you guys that, that polyolefin, the heat away, it's very much like a plastic. It's like all the goodness of plastic with the ability to heat it and brush away the excess uh, edges. I, I love that stuff. That stuff's really cool. Um, DJ Kev says 45 and 135 degree fill. I see. Yeah. If we're talking about the, um, if we're talking about um, the thread only method. Yeah. Thread only method is made by essentially creating a mesh. Uh, with something on top. Now I'm going to show you the Madeira method where it's a three part mesh and it's actually very similar in, uh, in Merrily when you make a thread only patch, it actually has that as an option. And it is, you essentially create something that's very similar to what you might think of as uh, if you're in the home market, a freestanding lace mesh, and then you add on top of that, your fill material to make the rest of the patch. It does, it does make a difference. But yeah, I would say, Cindy, you might have to do some more testing. Yeah, I know. I, I know I hate to say that. It's hard to say. But the funny thing is, I haven't had that much trouble with it. And I don't know. That's one of those things where it's like, is it the material that I was using at the time? Um, was that the sensitivity point? Was it the heat seal? I don't I don't quite know. What I will say is um, the materials I have used as far as the heat seal material, uh, Madeira was where I got them from. But like I said, if you find yourself with that heat applied the heat applied layer of adhesive, the chances are it's not made by that many people or that different chemically than somebody else's. Uh, the one thing I will say is a little different is I've seen people have trouble with the home adhesives that look more like a mesh. So there's different kinds of adhesive, uh, essentially the, like adhesive materials you can apply. Many people prefer for permanent adhesion of patches, especially like the caps, the thick film-like adhesive instead of the heat and bond is the commercial name that we hear for those. The problem is I've seen people swear up and down that heat and bond works for them. And I'm going to say from my personal experience, um, one of the problems I've had with heat applied patches and why I really always tell people the gold standard for me is to sew patches on is that depending on the garment you're sewing on and the finish that it has, you can have problems with adhesives. It's not all the time. But I've had issues with um, materials that have had some sort of uh, chemical applied to them for either water resistance or some other sort of sizing is on the material. Some sort of prep or chemical has interfered with adhesives before, especially those of you who try to use liquid adhesives, the ones that look like uh, that look like a liquid, like uh, super glue. Patch attach is a commercial one that's used in the home. I have had terrible luck with patch attach on hats. In general, I wouldn't recommend it. It doesn't mean it doesn't work for some people. Some people swear by it. Other people use extremely strong construction style adhesives or they'll use like E6000 on hat patches. I don't love that because it off gases, it stinks, and it's rough. I don't love using stuff like that and it's sticky and nasty to use. It's just kind of hard in a shop not to get that dirty or have some, some of that smear around at some point. Don't love using it. I'm not going to say that you're doing the wrong thing for using it. Make sure it's safe to put next to somebody's head. Make sure it's something that's safe for you to use long-term. And then if, if it has to be somewhere ventilated, 
for sure be ventilating it. I prefer heat applied films for that. Um, and like I said, the film style tends to be better for me than any of the home market type styles that are mesh like. But that's the thing. Uh, it, it really depends. And unfortunately, I have had problems with different fabrics in the patch uh, space as well. Some people have really lovely patch materials. I used to get my patch material once again from Nmart, which is no longer selling. They had a lovely material because Nmart was actually a store run by a parent company called Ensign Emblem that was a patch maker. And so their patch twill that they would sell you was 100% the kind of twill you expect from a big commercial patch maker. But in the put-ups, it was a little more expensive. It wasn't terrible. But like I said, it really depends on your market. For me, the market was fine and the cap was fine. I had enough, enough work on it. It was fine. But you know what I mean? Like I said, it, it is certainly not a problem to, to try that stuff out. I would say everybody should try different materials out and see. And talk to the people who make your materials. I know in talking with, uh, and I'll just call out stalls because it's a place where I got a lot of heat press materials uh, made for me when I had to order things in. In talking to stalls, even though you may find that they give you this range of heat that's supposed to work for something, there are times where I've called them and said, I've got a garment that's not going to stand up. Like I've got a piece of uh, equipment that's got a nylon, whatever, nylon shell that I'm trying to put a patch on. Is there a possibility for me to still heat press this? Can I use more pressure with less, like with or a longer dwell time with less heat? Is that a thing? Is bottom platen heat or top heat important or what have you? And they've sometimes come up and told me that there are other methods of applying that aren't on the data sheet. I mean, start on the data sheet from whatever material you're using, whether that's your heat press material, whatever. But it, when that doesn't pan out or you have a specialty thing that keeps happening, talk to the people who make these things because it can be useful. Um, Got to. Like I mean, actually, yeah, this is exactly what Cindy said. Dime has a fantastic twill, works perfectly, but not price wise for commercial purposes. No wrinkles ever. Yeah, yeah. The thing to look for is if you can get something similar in a larger quantity. Um, fairly often, people are white labeling stuff. I don't know what's going on with the white balance on my camera. I apologize for that, folks. I'll I'll tune that in before next time that my green screen's going crazy. Been th talking about fixing up the background in the in the uh, home studio to make that not a green screen. And that might have to happen sooner and later if I keep having these problems. Logitech updated today <laughs> on my camera and it's driving me crazy. Uh, DJ Kev says, uh, question, I've seen a method with water soluble where you create the thread fill as the base and then stitch a satin puff on top for more 3D effect. What's your method on puff patches? I would treat it like any other puff. Frankly, if you make one of those thread fills as the base, if it's done in that same way with the mesh, you're essentially putting together a piece of fabric and the puff should run pretty similarly that it run on any other fabric. The only thing I would say is I definitely like using water soluble for anything where I'm putting a lot of strain on it and 3D puff's going to put a lot of strain on it. Remember, you're doing incredibly high densities. What I would watch for in any of these is to make sure that it's going to hold up to the strain, but I don't think there'd be anything particularly uh, set up any different way on that. That's something I haven't done a lot of. I've done a 3D uh, border, but the thing is the 3D border I did was on top of the twill essentially. It was right at the edge of the twill. So for me, there really wasn't any difference. I'm running on fabric and I was doing, like you said here on water soluble, which it was holding up to that extra edge. Um, for my money, the problems are always gonna be the same. We're gonna say, are we perforating the material underneath it? And are we putting a bunch of strain on it? And when is the right time to do that? If you're on a couple layers of that fibrous water soluble and you've made a mesh uh, very much like the, the, the fills that I, I was talking about previously, that, that underlay mesh, it would be similar. I'll, I will, though, give you the caveat. I'll give you the judgment call that I haven't done a ton of this stuff because like the 3D script patches is nothing I ever got into and it wasn't really commercially viable for me, at least. I wasn't doing that. That was something that for me, it was not interesting to us and we didn't have a lot of call for it. So most of my patches were either thread-based patches that were done at need for uh, reasons of like aesthetic reasons, like color, uh, color selections were a big reason why we did 3D, uh, did the thread ones or a uh, quick turnaround rather than go hunting down a particular color of twill, I could get a thread patch out very quickly, at least quicker than waiting for shipment of, of a twill color or not being able to match that twill color, like I said, aesthetically. Um, that's really where I did most of my patches that were thread-based. Foam on patches almost always happened in concert with some sort of support material inside of that. So I'm just going to say my experience is not 100% there. And I'm not going to say I've run tons of those because I have not. I have run foam like that, not a ton and not enough to give you my encapsulated version of what I'd say works every single time or that I could throw on a multi-head machine and just let run. I wouldn't say that I've got that. 
Foam on caps, tons of foam on caps. Uh, foam on patches, less foam on patches. Foam on substrate only, not so much. On solubles only, not so much. Not not hardly at all. And yes, Doug, Doug and Cindy, absolutely. Dimes not wholesale, no way. Uh, the home market shopping usually is something that's done on retail. Um, like I was telling you guys earlier, I was buying from Nmart. I wish they hadn't gone out of business. They had a wonderful person uh, who was working for them and, and kept Nmart together. And when she wasn't there anymore, they eventually discontinued selling. I wish they still sold because they were more like wholesale pricing for some of the same put ups and sizes and amounts that we would get in that home market where we had real patch twill and some of that fused patch twill, but coming to us at prices that really made sense, or at least were easier to make sense at a wholesale level. All right. So with that, I'm going to very briefly go over a couple of little digitizing things, not a ton. I'm just going to bring up some files and talk about it. Uh, surely I'm just going to give you a quick concept of, of you know, edges and just kind of run through them very quickly and then show you a couple of samples. But we're not going to go super deep into digitizing today because honestly, I think there's just not time to do it justice. And I don't want to hang on for three hours today and continue pushing into a full workshop class. But we'll talk a little bit about it. Um, I'll go ahead and bring up some slides just to very quickly shuffle through them and say, you know, soluble substrates where we often, I often start, but I'm just going to talk about borders. I often start by making entire border. If we're making a satin style border in a moment, I'm going to show you a uh, marrow leaf from Imbrilliance, which does all of this automatically. If you like a marrowed edge, a faux marrowed edge, you can do this without any of this work, frankly. But in this case, I used to make my borders first on my satin bordered patches so that I could use them as a guide for the width. And that just helped me to figure out all of my other kinds of edges here. Um, usually I've got a 0.4 millimeter like inset from the desired finish shape on this piece. And that means that we had an overall larger inset. It was almost like 0.8 total. This is not gonna go over all these measurements because we're not gonna get, get super deep. The thing to kind of realize though is that you're going to want your border to hang over even your pre-cut edges and you want a fairly decent amount of it. You want, you really don't want to be just outside of the edge because that's where little bits of shifting can cause problems. Trust me, people will say, oh my gosh, you almost have a millimeter of overhang on some of these edges, especially if anything shifts. It shrinks up, it holds together. Thread does not just float away from these pieces. If you had multiple millimeters of edge uh, inset off of your patch material, I'd worry. For most of these, up to in, and including like 0.8 millimeters is going to be all right. Being a little off of the patch edge is not going to immediately collapse the entire edge. Um, remember how big a millimeter is. So pe some people will try and get that fabric all the way out to the edge. And now you've got all the same problems you have with hot cut. And in fact, you're probably going to have to melt the edge if you hadn't already. So you need an inset. Most of mine, I used this kind of edge run plus double zigzag to make a little bit more body on the patch. Uh, just to have a little more, more body to the edge. But really, we're just talking about that overall inset. And you can see the inset to the underlay is about 0.8 millimeters. The inset to the edge of that double zigzag is around 0.6. This might be automatic depending on software that you're running. But you can see kind of how it's constructed just to see what we're looking at for how that edge was made. And generally, I would lock the border in place, put together my placement lines where I've got my insets. Usually I'm using tools that allow me to do contours, meaning that I can kind of set my edge and then pull in from that edge. And like I said, this is not something that I'm going to go ahead and run out exactly, but you lock that layout in. And then honestly, you work on top of it. Placement line is further in because you actually want the fabric to go over the edge of the placement line. We don't want the placement line floating outside of the edge. You want the placement line to be just under the edge of your final cut. So your cut line's a little further out. Your hand cut line be in the same place if you're going to hand cut it. Then we tack down. When I was making my own builds, I often used a larger zigzag to hold them down. Really depends on how you feel. Lots of people do a, a satin stitch, the same one that you're looking at, or a straight stitch, same one that you're looking at kind of here with a deeper inset. Some people will just use a straight stitch to hold it down. I used a zigzag because early on, uh, I often was using materials that I had to salvage. If something went wrong at this part of the point of, of putting this together, of edging the patch, I would often want to salvage my patch. And when I had a zigzag, it was really easy for me to snip the zigzags and pull it off of there and start again on a new piece of substrate. So when I had to do that, especially when I was doing costuming and you know costuming emblems where I'm maybe using materials that I'm not purchasing or that are specialties, you might have to worry about that stuff. So appliques, type settings, but similar to that. 
once you put all the borders in place, you leave that satin border, the final border on the bottom until the end, and then you drag that up to the front. So I would resequence it afterwards. It's just a nice tip to say it helps you to put things together if you're having to build your thing together. Let me go ahead and quickly and show you the thread only emblems. And then I'm going to run you through a couple things and show you the, uh, the imbrilliance method through Merrily at the end too. This is that thread only emblem. And yes, you're creating a mesh. Uh, and these are instructions. You want the you want these measurements. These are very similar to the measurements you're going to find over at Madeira for use on their plastic system. So if you go look at that polyolefin, the easy film that I showed you earlier, the heat away easy film, um, that heat away easy film has a very similar look uh, to this, right? So we create a shape that's just inside your intended finish edge, 0.8 mils. Yeah, they like to have an edge run underlay. I have done this without that edge run. I think that may be a little bit too much. Um, a little bit too much perforation. So you can take the edge run out if you want to. They like to establish the shape first. Uh, I haven't found that it always makes a difference, especially with nice stable shapes like this, like this shield shape. Though as you saw with some of my earlier stuff, I do really crazy wild shapes that have insets and holes in the same fashion. Uh, but you create a mesh. You start with a 45 degree fill, stitch length about four, four millimeters, density of two millimeters. So we're talking about 20 embroidery points for that density. Then we go the other direction. You can see the egg entry and exit points here. The green is the entry. The, the red is the exit point on the shape. Uh, we go back the other direction, opposing that 135 degrees. So now we've got our mesh, very much like a bi-directional knockdown stitch in an enthusiast, or if you make the light mesh fill the way I teach people to manually digitize it when they have to, um, that's the same sort of method. This is going to give us all manner of strength and anything we stitch on top, it's going to be able to lay on multiple pieces of thread, no matter what angle it's going to be at. Uh, the difference being generally thread only patches, you have a third run that is at that zero degrees or at 90 degrees, depending on how you're set, where generally we've got a zero degree horizontally. Some people are going to do a horizontal final fill. So you're going to have a zero degree uh, uh, or a, you know, they'll have a 90 degree fill instead. But in this case, we essentially have our 45, our 135, and then our, our zero, our horizontal. If we're doing it in the traditional way that, like I said, Madeira often shows you and you often see done on the plastic method. And then the last part is you're doing this uh, fill set to 90 degrees and it's essentially a standard fill stitch for full coverage. So 40 weight thread, you're talking about, you know, 4.2, maybe points for, uh, you know, 0.42 mils, 0.4 mils. You have to play with it because I will say this, if you go really light on this, sometimes you'll hold up your plastic patch and you can see through it. Usually not when it's on a garment. However, you hold it up to the light and you can see through it. And the customer may not love that, even if when they put it on the garment, it doesn't really show through that much. Um, I will sometimes use a little bit of edge jaggedness. You can see this at the top. Feathering or edge jaggedness can help you not perforate dead on one line when you first do this fill. Uh, so I will often use a little bit of jaggedness that's going to get covered up by the final border when I do these. And I just find that there's just a little less tear out when I do that. Um, is that scientific? No. I, I used to do it and it seemed to have less tear out than when I didn't do that, especially if you tried to use like an edge following. If you, di if you did traveling edges, traveling the edge will puncture it way more than a normal fill. Uh, fills tend to have an offset kind of chisel end on every, op every other line. Uh, but this, I actually went further than that and added a small percentage of edge jaggedness or feathering. And then you run whatever central design material. In this case, the border accidentally showed up on my preview at the same time. And then you run your final border after that. So if you have any edge material, you run that and then your final border afterwards. In this case also, just want to let you know if you're doing multiple colors or let's say you have an inset color in the center of this piece, don't run the entire fill over it. Just run that triple mesh and then you run fills on top of it afterward. You don't want to run an entire fill of a color and then come back and fill big pieces on top of it cut out those elements. Or if you're doing like this, a bicolor shield or something like that, you definitely want those last fills to be offset a little bit in angle from each other and from the background, whatever the last thing you used for your fill stitch was for that to create that three stage mesh. But you don't want to run like an entire color and then we're going to go back and put big filled planks on it. You don't have to do that. You can go ahead and cut out elements, cut out central areas. Like let's say we were in this and the central area was a different color. I would only fill that background edge and that I'd fill that central color. I would not fill the entire thing in orange and then go back and put another color in that central shield. That's not happening. I'm going to go ahead and split those up. Only thing I want to make clear is that when you get to the edges, you see here in those little offsets, you want to offset your angles from fill to fill to make sure they don't fall into each other. Uh, if you put them both at the same angle, they'll blend at the edge and it'll look rough. 
So you want to offset them by a small angle, no matter what angles you're working at. They have to be a little bit offset from each other. But finally, you build your border out very much like I showed you with the other one, and it's very similar. So I build out the border very similarly. Um, it doesn't have the placement or any of the rest of that stuff on it, but I do like to use uh, fairly heavy underlays on my borders. I do use double zigzag and edge runs because I want to lift that border up and really give it that patch edge border, especially if I'm doing satins where I don't get all that extra lovely texture. Um, very quickly, I'll show you that hot knife reinforcement border that people talk about. Reinforced hot knife border, really pretty simple. It's a denser reinforced border, but it really is as simple as this. It's one satin stitch that's at a fairly dense density, normal density for, for coverage with a very dense uh, zigzag. This is where the, we've usually seen this done. This is not what all hot cutters do, but when someone tells you they're using a reinforced hot cut border, it looks like this. Heavy satin stitch border, but then what you're going to see is a secondary satin on top of that that's half of the width of it, and that's half the density. So what you end up with is at the, the farther edge of this border, you're getting like a, a one and a half density border at that farther edge. And that means when you're pushing up against that sucker, you have this pretty heavy ridge and you get a little bit of texture. But then I'll show you uh, faux marrowing in a moment. But this is like, that's the reinforced one. It's essentially just a doubled border edge. Faux marrowing, I'll just show you, this is one of our pieces out of uh, Merrily software that I did for sampling. But let me show you the entire piece. I'm not gonna go through the entirety of faux marrowing. What I think I'm gonna do instead for that is just show you this in the software. So I'll show you a couple pieces in software. We can talk about those patches and we'll end on that. So like I said, not gonna go super deep into all the different stuff. I will just show you some patch pieces that I've got queued up. I have a ton of stuff on both of uh, both this. And if we look in my, um, like I said, in the deck that I prepared earlier, I am gonna show you some stuff there and we'll, we'll jump into software as well. But like I said, um, Really, patches are fairly simple. They're very much like applique, and they can be even more simple if you have, like I said, the ability to use something like Merrily where it does it automatically. So first, let me just go ahead and once again grab that. We'll grab that that picture I just showed you. You can see it stitching uh, live. That's a faux marrowed border being stitched. This is done in a water-soluble method. I've done it on plastic method. Never have had a problem doing that. In fact, all of these are plastic method. My hat patches are all done uh, in the same style from Merrily. I'll go ahead and pull that up. The one that I'm wearing, the Memento Mori patch, this Ars Longa patch, you can get close to that and you'll see that faux marrowing stitch that's on there. Those are all plastic method and it's done directly out of uh, out of Merrily from Imbrilliance. So that is a specific product, obviously, but you can do that. People do faux marrowing with uh, motifs as well, but it doesn't do the automatic shape handling. And that's something that, like I said, I'm not going to hit that really hard today, aside from just letting you know that um, cornering when you're doing your own motif runs, you have to do a lot of work on the cornering to make the cornering work very well. Uh, if you have shapes like we do in Merrily, where it's an automatically generated foam arrowing, um, rare because we have that, but then you can put whatever corners together and it'll handle all that cornering and working around uh, rounded edges without you having to move those motifs around to make that work. So it just depends on how much work you want to put into it. But let me go ahead and bring that, that back up. You can see that's a foam arrowed edge. And here's me doing the old school rinse method. You can see it rinsing away and you get this really complete full wrap around that edge. Even though I'm using bobbin here, of course, we know interlock machines, embroidery machines, we know that rule of thirds for our satin stitches. We're getting a nice wrap through our material. And by that wrapping kind of action, we get a nice clean border, especially when using that rinse out method, you don't see a lot of that edge. But certainly you guys have seen, I've done lots of detailed patch pieces for patch companies. I've done them manually. This is a satin bordered patch that I did pre-cut uh, with the poly twill. Um, all this stuff that I did for, you know, night shift. This is the one for Better Call Saul with the Albuquerque Police patch. All of these were done different methods. This, this is one that was produced commercially and was a hot cut. But I also did that piece as a sample, as a thread only. The other thing I didn't talk about is you can you can use pre-edged sample pieces. If you're running just inside of a, of a pre-edged patch, you can go ahead and use these uh, like an applique. You use an adhesive backing. You put a placement line down. You can tack them if you want to tear them back out later, but you can just literally, if, if you don't have too much stitching going into it, you stick these suckers down on a piece of tearaway material, uh, stabilizer, run your central stuff and tear it away because these are pre-edged blanks that you can purchase. That is obviously an option. It's something I don't talk about a lot because it doesn't really take a lot of extra effort. It's just you stick it down, you sew your material on it, and you tear it out. Really not a big deal. Um, 
these ones were the ones we did the, the plastic method just to show you them a little closer up. You can see that the edges are pretty clean on these. Uh, uh, these ones have been hit with some heat. So this is not just torn out of the plastic with no issue. These have a little bit of heat that was applied to them. But you can see the one at the back was done with the commercial uh, plastic solution. The one in the front was done with the home-based, like big box store plastic. And you aren't going to see a lot of difference between the two. And those were made entirely of thread, like the one I just showed you uh, with that material method. You can see there's that commercial version. You can see that hoop I talked about. Or if you wanted to attach them directly, that's a very special system for the Madeira MFS. But I did tons of pre-made patches, like, like you're seeing here, where I would drop text on a pre-made patch. Did that all the time. Uh, here's some more done with the uh, soluble method. Ones I did for Better Call Saul. Uh, and here you can see the original one that I did for the San Antonio Police, where I, I uh, actually had to sublimate the patch material before I did it, uh, sent that off and sublimated the color. What you're going to find, though, uh, whenever you stitch through sublimated materials, it reveals a little bit of the white thread that or the white fabric that's underneath. And you're going to find that with any sublimated material you stitch through. Like I said, same kind of methods. These methods all make nice patches. Uh, it really just depends on how much work you want to put into each of these, right? I mean, this is another one with pre-cuts and done on soluble materials. Um, same here. These are soluble. And like I said, you can do the great thing with inverted edge patches. We can do things like this where not only do we have really complicated shapes in the edges, uh, we can have cutouts. We can have insets that come out, especially with soluble materials. It's very much easier uh, plastic materials, you can tear it out and weed it very much like vinyl as well. But you can do these really uh, complicated shapes that have insets where um, marrowing really wouldn't work. However, you can do that if you use automatic systems like you, especially the only one I know that does it, you use Merrily and Merrily or Stitch Artist 3 has the ability to do really deep insets. But, you know, the satin edges look pretty nice. Satin edge patches like these rockers for regulators you can do some really great satin edge patches that look lovely. Um, there's nothing wrong with those. I just have to say, given the opportunity, once I saw what we could accomplish um, with what Brian put together for Merrily, there is something just really particularly lovely about the faux marrowed edge on this thing. And I think, honestly, the other thing I kind of showed you guys when I was showing you my hat patches, I really do love the look. These are um, polyester. This is a, a matte finish polyester. Uh, and I really like the look of the matte finish polyester with that stark contrast. And you can really see the little inset kind of reveals the little diamonds that appear, the little triangles that appear in a marrow stitch. I do like that quite a lot. I like that look, a real textured look to that stitch is cool. Let's pull up software. Let's actually go into some stuff and take a look at it. And I'll show you some stuff that is just, you know, my, my usual. <laughs> We're just show you some stuff that I had done before. And then we'll actually show you some Merrily stuff too, because why not? But let's just go ahead and take a look at some patches really quickly to kind of finish off the last few minutes. So just to show you, you know, any manner of complicated thing can be done. Lots of the patches I did were like this, though. Often had a material that was shown through. If we look at this piece, I can hide the applique position on this. It actually has a, a material that's shown. If I hide it, um, all the black that was in this piece was the material showing through. And you can see that I used some light densities in this piece because you can show a little bit of black through without contrast problems. Did lots of cool um, contour fills on this piece, which is fun. But a lot of these patches are generally using the color. The reason I showed this one is just to say, um, make sure when you're doing patches that you don't fill where you don't have to. This one, I let all of the fabric show through for the black. You often would use a light half density fill in that area to put some texture on it. But for these folks uh, at Sandia Labs, they were happy to have that show through. A um, couple other things just to show you once again, this is that, that MFS method, the plastic method thread only that I showed you before. And here's how it looks put together manually. You can see all of the different pieces. There's the 45 grid, the 135 grid, the zero and the 90. I'm just going to run it through so you see it. 45, 135, zero, and then the 90 degree fill. Then we have our satin border. And that's all we really need to worry about on that. But that's just to show you what that looks like put together. Um, lots of the patches that I did were contour patches like this. Uh, we talked about that one. There's the top notch rocker just to show you what that looked like. Again, uh, had that material, the foam material behind it. Let's go ahead and hide that position stitch. Uh, actually what I think I'm going to do instead is just turn off the, uh, applique on this. So you don't see that. Uh, so you can kind of just see what I'm talking about. Turn off the simulated applique. And I just want to show you once again, these are essentially applique type stitches. These old school satin patches are a placement line attack line, central material, 
outlines on this particular one because it outlines. And then we're doing that nice border over the top. So that's a real, it's really simple to put them together if you want to. Um, same thing here. This is a lovely contour piece I did, and this was done manually. Once again, placement line, tack down. The central material, in this case, it was done in a hash style that was nice and loose with all of our border pieces done. And then we have a nice heavy border on the end of it. The thing I'm going to tell you about, though, is that that, you know, though that is nice and simple and looks good, uh, this one particularly kills me because what I could have done so much easier uh, in our software would have made this a lot simpler. Because if you look at this piece, um, it's got a nice contour, but I had to edit it and work on it. The contour was not just automatically generated. Whereas the great thing about like Merrily, which is what we kind of have as a, it's a, an option for more of a consumer type option. You can certainly digitize your own in Stitch Artist 3 and get our cool uh, faux marrowing stitch. But the thing I love here is that I really could have done a, a one-click solution on this. If I just said at patch edge page wrap with Merrily, um, that's automatic. <laughs> and it hurts my heart for how many times I've drawn a manual uh, contour that this is something that could be automatically done. But what I wanted to show you is here is this fairly complicated edge and we can see that Merrily is handling all of the corner overlaps. It's handling all these insets. And it really doesn't require me to do any more tweaking or work to it. Now, because I have st the Stitch Artist range of products, if I want to, I can go back into this shape if I really want to. And I can edit that shape. So that is possible for me to convert that to objects and edit that out. I'm not going to do that at the moment. Because the other thing I want to show you with this is if we were using something automatic from Merrily, um, I could still put this last. I'll show you in a second how you use multiple copies where I can say, turn off this top stitch. So I only want my placement line, my position line. This is a cut when complete. If I were using a pre-cut, then it would add a tack down. Uh, if I were going to use a light fill, then it adds just a textural fill. This is not to make the patch out of, this is just to add a texture to the piece. Um, if I wanted to use this interactivity to create the entire patch using the fill, then I could. And in fact, if I was doing that, then I probably wouldn't worry too much about the edge. I go ahead and run the edge at the same time and I can go ahead and add that top stitch. Now I have that edge and the fill. And what you're going to see is uh, with no digitizing involved, it's made that same sort of fill that I wanted for the regular style here. And then my top edging is done automatically and I have that whole piece. Now certainly I would have to go back in and change my colors so it matched the, you know, the eventual piece that I was trying to work on. In this case, this was the original that I made, I've actually got that on that slide deck, uh, you know, it was white and I, I want to go in and change that up if I wanted to see it in the way that I expected it to be uh, border on this was black. So I'm sure if I want to do that, I can, you know, we can go ahead and switch it to the actual colors of the piece. But as you saw, that was a really quick way of going from a design. And by the way, this design that you just saw, that is a DST file. That is not original. Uh, that is not original shapes. These are just stitches. That's all that is. That is pulled in from another piece of software. So this means that if you use Merrily, you can essentially make a marrow foam arrow edge patch like that in two clicks from any design that you have. Um, but if you want to make stuff yourself, you can. And in fact, um, though this one was done in that same stack, what I want to show you is you can do uh, patches that have elements that run into the edge. I mean, I've shown you some other stuff I've done. If you look at some of the other patches I, I've done that are more detailed, they have materials that run into the edge. And in fact, I'll go ahead and swap out to my, um, let's go out to this these graphics and it'll show you. Lots of the stuff I do has borders that go out to the edge. Elements of the pieces go under the, the final edging. And that's another reason why you might want to run your edging last. Um, they might have fills that go out to the outside edge. They might have detail pieces. You might also have, like you'll see in um, this piece, You've got full borders and things that have to go under the edge border. Now, in this case, it's only un in the central element, but I have pieces like this that I've done where the entirety of the design is going to stretch out to that outer edge. And when you do that, you definitely have to run your edge last for that reason as well. So it's not just because of uh, tear away or tearing out that you might do that. And depending on what you're running, you might find that you have elements that you have to go under that edge that might have to be done last. And in this case, I'm just going to show you a, a technique reason or a textural reason I actually added this textural fill, this kind of, um, you'll see that we've got this accordion style fill for this piece. This is one that I showed you guys previously. So I can show you the final piece again, if you want to take a look at it. 
I'll just go ahead and drag that up as a graphic for you guys to see. That's what the final piece looks like for the My Karma patch. So, and this one is done on polyester twill, but I also did a version where I did it thread only. I found that I liked the twill version better, but you can see that I've got this blue accordion fill just to add that kind of texture. So accordion fill or gradient fill, depending on your software, but that was added as an extra element. So what I want to show you is even when we're using automated tools like we have in, um, that we have in Merrily or that we would use for uh, Stitch Artist 3 where you draw your own shape, which is actually how we make all of those patch edge uh, pieces that are in Merrily, what you actually end up with is just multiple copies of the same shape to get your patch edge done. What I want to show you, I'll just drag this out. I've got a patch shape that is essentially my placement line and my tack down line that runs before everything else. Then I have, um, this, these are just envelopes. Those just help to warp my text. They don't have to be in place. If I move them over here though, my lettering is all gonna jump over here, but those don't stitch. Those are just elements to warp this lettering because this is live lettering. I can always show you that if you wanna see it warp live. That's the stuff that's in ACES 1. If you haven't seen that yet, that's that product that I showed you guys a couple of times ago that I've, I've worked on all those fonts and shapes for. But what you're gonna see is, I have a slightly inset shape that's a fill shape and I generated that using the contour tool. And that's just set up right after I tack down my material. So if we look at that in the stages, uh, and we can take a look at that again in a second here, and I gotta change my, I messed up my envelope just a second ago, let me fix my envelope because I did that earlier. I was messing with my envelope and killed it. Here we go, let's fix that. <laughs> Sorry about that folks. Uh, yeah, I messed up my envelope in a way that uh, screwed up the text placement, but there it is, now it's working again. Suffice it to say, though, what we can see is if we go to run this back, the way this is put together, if you're ever trying to do this with, and it's the same with applique tools, sometimes people will put together applique tools where it's one shape that puts down your tack down and your other stuff, and then the border, and people freak out because they can't run things under the border. Well, then all you have to do is copy and paste that same, that same element, and almost any software will allow you to turn on and off which things you're going to work on. In this case, for this patch edge, what you can see in the interactive is my top stitching is turned off. If I turn that back on, then it would have a, a, a border on it. But if we go back to the final piece, my positioning is turned off and there's nothing else inside of that. So position is turned off on this one. There's no preview of the fabric because there's no fabric there. In this case, I have the fabric previewed and the position is turned on, but I've turned the top stitching off. So the first object, I only draw this object once or generate this object once but I can use it in two places to create my stack. So just to kind of show you this, this is something that people freak out about just using the same shapes they draw, even if they're just making a fill and putting a border on it. I don't always use the same shapes for that, but if you are going to, you just make two copies of the shape. It's easy enough to do. You don't have to worry about where that's going. But we've got our placement line and our tack down, and then you'll see I actually start my little accordion fill. So there's my gradient fill. And it's a gradient fill with a curve on it goes to a nice light density. Then I start doing my text. And in this case, they're all three different colors. So I don't worry too much about the ins and outs of where that text is going. Goes on top of that nice light fill. And then you're going to see uh, the edge that builds up the edge for the Merrily. You get a nice, to get that nice uh, heavy edge, we have a buildup that happens, a little zigzag that happens before the Merrily edge. And then the faux marrowing comes in. And once again, this one was an automatically generated contour. You can make your own shapes. Obviously, it's how we do them in Merrily as well. But that's something that's done, uh, like I said, in that setup where it does that automatic cornering. And just to kind of make that point, you know, I just wanted to make sure that was oh, everybody was aware of that and kind of understood the difference between doing that and using um, motifs for it. But that's something that's specific to a tool. But the thing is, you can do the same thing essentially with applique tools uh, in your software as well. If you want to do a patch and you don't have any of this, and it's not in your future right now. Maybe you want to get into this later, but you do have something that makes applique tools. The applique tool is very, very similar. It's placement lines, it's tack downs and edges. Just remember that if you want to run that edge last, either because you're on a film or because you're running something underneath the edge like this fill, you just copy and paste that object so you have two. Um, one last thing I want to do is just to show you guys, um, because it's something that I think is worthwhile to understand, how that automatic cornering does make a difference instead of using um, motifs to do it. We'll get outside of Ace here and we'll go over to Merrily. So here is the Merrily shapes. We can see some of the kind of wild shapes that we have here. Um, number one, you can also, we have multi-layer emblems that do that same thing. They actually have the placement lines separated from the rest of the outlines, but we've got some crazy shapes and stars that happen here. 
And if I bring any of these in that have those sharp shapes or the stars or crosses, just to show you how much this is being handled, I'm gonna go ahead and pop this Maltese cross in here. First thing you can see is we're getting both uh, mitered corners. We have mitered corners here and we have lapped corners. And these maintain, even if you resize or skew or reshape, it regenerates those according to the rules every time. And so that's something where if you're used to doing this manually, it's pretty, it's a pretty big deal that it'll handle that each time, even on fairly extreme shapes. So it's something just to think about as far as what tools you want to choose to use. Um, does not keep you from doing it. I made marrow, faux marrow edges myself back in the day, but given the option of handling it in a much more um automated way and handling these really kind of crazy insets and shapes like these horns and corners and not having to deal with it. Uh, just to show you what this thing is really created out of, as far as what the drawing is, I will convert this out. If I go to my digitizing part of this, I can go ahead and convert this to objects. And if we're looking at this object here and we look at the edge object, the only drawing that had to be done is this edge. So I will convert that out to a straight stitch so you can see it. That's all that was done. So there's there's our shape entirely. No more work was done to it than that. But then if we apply that patch edge to it, um, immediately we get that shape. And we get all that automatic cornering handled for us um, at scale. So that's something that's worthwhile to know about that as an automatic tool. So like I said, I'm not gonna go too deep into it. You can make patches from any manner of tools. It's great to have the automated tools. Uh, fantastic to be able to use them, makes things easy. But I made a lot of my original stuff with just regular satin stitches. You know, the tools aren't that crazy. They aren't that hard to use. You can use satins. You can use other edges. I do like to use satins because we do get that um, full coverage. And especially if you're hand cutting, you're not heat cutting, you're doing something where there might be some fraying, uh, then looking at this piece, you can see that that's going to give you a lot of coverage and really enable you to have that extra kind of meat to it so that when we go to cover, and I'll kind of get close to that so you can see the edge. When we go to get that coverage, a little bit of jitter, a little bit of bad placement won't kill the edge and won't ruin your patch. So often you would see, I've got a little bit of jitter already there, but then when we go to the final edge, there is a little bit of thickness outside that edge to allow for just a little shifting in positioning. Um, but the thing is that's also built in. That's built in and you can change the way you cut. Uh, as far as using automation as well. But any of these tools are available to you. Uh, patch making is not what I would consider a particularly difficult thing to do. And especially with modern tools involved, it makes it even easier. And the difference is really about your aesthetics and everything else. So like I said, really depends uh, what you're in for. The thing to understand is that everything is essentially going to be about your trade-offs of what is important to you as far as the time spent and the manual labor that's involved. Uh, Melanie says, I've got a question before I get done. What about two colors of tackle tool, like maybe two circles? Would it be best to pre-cut a, a hole in the second or outer and sew a border or whatnot over the two edges? Um, for tackle twill, I would actually probably double layer it. Uh, especially on a big patch, I would double layer that, or a small patch that has details, I would double layer that. On a really big applique patch, I have done what you said and inset it. But unless I'm putting multiple layers together, um, I'm going to say that usually your little borders and things are going to be really thin to try and make something that has a hole in it. It's more likely to warp and ripple. I would probably put the whole slab of patch twill. And then if I was going to do another piece of twill, I'd put it right on top. I probably wouldn't worry about, about um, cutting it out. I have on a really large piece done so. Um, there's a piece, and I don't have a, the picture pulled up right now, that is essentially... Um, that is essentially a large applique bag. It could have been a patch and it has a big red ring with inside of it is a wolf's head with also around it is a white ring on the inside. Those I layered to a single layer, but they were really big and they didn't have that kind of a, that uh, desire to ripple up. They didn't have that really little thin pieces that would ripple up or fall apart. If I were doing a really small patch and doing multiple layers of twill, I think I just wouldn't want to try and cut real small pieces like that or cut out holes. But at the same time, um, I can see why you might might desire to not have the extra layering, but I think two layers of twelve be fine. So yeah, it really depends. It would depend on how big the piece is that you're trying to do. But two circles of twelve on a medium sized patch, I'm probably just going to drop those on top of each other and be okay with that extra bulk. I don't think it would cause much trouble. Cindy says, "Wow, super cool. Yeah, I like it." Uh, Carol says, "Okay, I got to have Merrily. What I'm going to say though, if you have Stitch Artist three, Janice saying she's learning Stitch Artist three, 
The patch edge in Stitch Artist 3 is the same edge from Merrily. Merrily just allows anyone to very quickly wrap any design they have. That page wrap function I showed you, and there's also functions to throw just a properly sized circle and a properly sized rectangle around to that same, uh, anything that's in the center of your of your design page. That's the thing that's cool with, uh, with Merrily. The thing is with Stitch Artist 3, if you don't mind doing multiple steps, you can uh, select your stitches, uh, outline the stitches and then expand the outline with a contour with the offset. And then you can go back in and add the patch edge. It would do the same stuff. You would end up with the same stuff with more steps um, with stitch artist three, but yeah, Merrily is really cool. Uh, Merrily does do that very automatically. And that's pretty cool. So uh, on that patch, you're talking about the, my karma patch, I'm going to assume uh, what type of twill did you use? And did you do heat seal? Here's the fun thing about this patch, right? This was one of those times where I was trying to uh, talk about, where I was trying to talk about like, hey, you know, I, I do weird sampling and funny stuff that is not for everybody. This particular patch uh, was actually using um, some of that pre-sealed material that has uh, buckram fused to it. So this particular one has some stiffness to it. It was it was fused to a crinoline or a buckram style material. And that one was done as a pre-cut. So I pre-cut that and put that in as a, on that Buckram style material. I did not use heat seal on this particular patch. If I were going to though, this would be super easy because this one doesn't have any plastic or anything else going on behind it uh, because I used the heat away film and I ripped away the excess on this piece. So I stitched, stitched out that design and then I ripped away the excess. Um, you could just put heat seal on the back of it, but I did not. But this twill was that pre-made patch twill that actually has a fused backing to it. So it's really pretty stiff. The thing I'm going to say is though, these hat patches I've been doing, a couple of these hat patches, this was another thing where somebody asked me a question. I said, can I do it or not? Or what is it? Somebody asked, can I use the patches that you see in the fabric store that have heat seal on them for patching elbows? And people were asking me, could I use that material? And I looked at it. Somebody showed me a piece of it. So I bought some at a, at a sewing store just to see what it was like at a craft store and said, all right, it's got heat seal on it. And I used it and it worked really well for me. What I'm going to say is there was a little more uh, needle drag as it was going through the, the material that was on the back. And um, on top of that, there was some of that haze. Remember I talked about that white haze you have from adhesive coming to the front. When I was running the black ones, there was a little bit of haze that happened uh, on the front of those two, but I really did. I used that material, not because I'm recommending it, but because somebody said, hey, I see these in the store and they have heat seal on the back. If I sewed through those and then pressed them, would they stick? Uh, in this case, I'm going to say because I've used backing on them, of course, they're not going to. And you'd have to take away all of your soluble, soluble backing and then you could try and heat press it. But then you've got the edges and everything else in the way. I don't know if that's going to hold up or not. I didn't get a chance to test that. But they're like, could you sew through it? Could you use that twill if you had it? And it worked. Um, most twill is going to hold up. Most polyester twill, it, it heat cut fine. It did sew pretty well. Um, and I was pretty happy with the overall look. I mean, it wasn't bad. It's not, it is not perfect. It's kind of thin. It's and I, And like I said, I did find that it was wanting to stick to the needle a little more than I wanted it to. So that's the thing. Any, I find that any of the ones that have that heat seal material pre-fused to the back of that twill, um, it can be kind of a pain in the butt. I don't like it that much because even the commercial stuff, I had pre-purchased some commercial stuff that was actually made to be uh, hot cut and used as like numbers. And I used that and it had a really thick layer of white adhesive and it not only made the snow, but it was like sticking to the needles like crazy. Um, you got to test to find out. But the ones that I specifically used for the My Karma patch was a patch twill. It was sold as a patch twill that was pre-fused to a stiffener, to a crinoline. Uh, and then some of the ones that I've shown you here were done with the, that random, like I said, patches that were out of the sewing store. The thing is, most of the other ones that I've done that you've seen here are the pressure sensitive poly twill from stalls. Or I literally went to the store and bought polyester twill. So we're talking about walk in, buy polyester twill and walk out or order online, uh, same kind of patch weight polyester twill, but it's literally just, uh, the twill is the weave. It's not the material. Uh, polyester, of course, is the material, the fiber that we're talking about. But yeah, um, most of the time, I'm going to be honest and say that I have not had the kind of problems people keep telling me about 
most of these. I think a lot of it is when I hoop, I hoop very, very firmly and carefully and smoothly. If I'm having any kind of issue with adhering pre-cuts, I use a little bit of embroidery specific spray tack and flatten it very smoothly. And a lot of the stuff I've done wasn't done with super high, uh, high heat heat press. But I will say that I really haven't had that much trouble with all this wrinkling and everything else. But if you look at my digitizing, the thing I will say too is when you watch my digitizing run, I have a tendency to kind of center everything out almost like a cap because I've done a lot of work on not only caps, but on materials that shift and pucker a lot. There's a lot of that that's in my catalog. I did a ton of performance wear. So I have a tendency to run underlays to hold areas down and I have a tendency to work away from existing elements and it helps with the, um, at least the on machine part of that distortion. So that's kind of the thing. Uh, DJ Kemp says, can you briefly talk about double satin circle border parameters? Uh, speaking, I want to have two colors for the border. Are you talking about just two, two satin borders stacked together? I think honestly, the inner satin border, I'm just going to treat it like a satin stitch that's in the design. The one thing I will say I will tend to do on borders like that is a nice deep inset. Anytime I have two satins matching edge to edge, two circles that are edge to edge, I'm going to have like almost a 50% inset between the two. I'll run the inner circle of color first. It's probably on patched twill. As long as there's not a lot of contrast, it's going to be normal densities, you know, 0 0.4, 0 0.42, somewhere in there for 40 weight thread. I'm going to use an inset edge run, 0 0.6 to 0 0.8, probably inset depending. And I'm going to deeply overlap. So I'm going to let it reveal the amount of color I want for the two color border. I'm going to reveal that, but the outer border is going to run on top of that inner color. So if you want two colors for the border, that's usually what I'm going to do. I'm going to run a border first on the inside, the inner color first. That is just a regular satin stitch. There's really nothing much different about it. And then the border I showed you earlier that has that extra underlay to give it the oomph to pop it up, then I definitely am likely to pop that up, use that extra inset, extra stuff. Uh, last couple comments, then we're going to go. We are almost at two hours. This is a, like I said, ludicrous amount of time. I knew this was going to go too long. Um, Brian Bailey says, not to mention, this is very nice of him. Uh, Eric humbly won't talk a lot about it, but he made some extremely precise and refined fonts from Merrily, including some, including some that were quite small. Yeah, the fonts in Merrily, and there's multiple sizes, including 68 sizes of fonts. They are fonts that I thought needed to exist. They are, some are kind of specific, or at least they are very uh, well attested to for like Army, Air Force, Fire, Police. Uh, because that's a lot of the patchwork I did back in the day and the fonts that I needed. But there are some cool fonts in there as well, some fun fonts, but there's a lot of stuff in there that's made for small execution. Will you still have to adjust your pull compensation settings, occasionally squish a tall letter or something? Yeah, that, that can happen. Um, plus, I'm going to be really clear and, and tell you guys that though we do try to have decent uh, defaults on our, our designs and fonts run nicely at, at default setups, I am going to say um, most definitely I expect everybody to learn a little bit about how fabrics work with their density settings and with underlay settings. And when you're setting text, even just normal text on a normal garment, the default settings are not always what you need. If you're running on this work shirt, which is a fairly thin work shirt on a poplin dress shirt on a PK polar shirt on a sweatshirt on a French Terry track suit, you're going to need slightly different settings for probably for your pull compensation, for your underlay, for your density. Fonts, even native fonts, native fonts come in and allow you to change all that stuff. You're going to have to do maybe a little bit of testing unless you know that stuff ahead of time. And you're definitely going to have to change your settings for different materials. So though it is lovely to, to want to use default settings, it's fine for it to come in at any setting. Because there's a full expectation that if you run your patches at very different sizes for the lettering, or if you run your different letter, any lettering at, at radically different sizes around different materials, that you're going to tweak some of that stuff for sure. So just to, just to let you know, the thing is, yes, our software does have the ability for the BX people who do stitch based have underlays already placed and stuff. And that's why they do different sizes also, because they make tweaks for your, your size. But when you see the stuff coming in that's native, it's really common where people are like, why isn't the default setting exactly what I want? Because we're expecting that if you use it on different materials that you're going to use different default settings. It's not normal to expect the settings to be ideal right out of the box for everything because no one could know what fabric you're running on. 
Um, that's not a slight of any kind. It's just something to know that like you're best served by doing some tests on different materials and trying it out and looking at different sizes, scaling things and giving it a shot. Um, the best experience you can ever have is to let yourself have a little extra material and time and play. It's how I learned and it's how you get a, a sense for everything. Um, it's really important to get a sense. Like it's almost a physical sense. Uh, when I was in Iceland, a good friend of mine said, uh, you understand things below your lower jaw. Meaning it's not just all the stuff that I'm doing here. It's heady. I'm discussing all these theories. It's that you get it into your system. It's in your bones. You're touching thread. You're watching the memory machine run. You're watching the distortion live. And you feel the way that thread and needles and, and uh, fabric interact and move together. And it's a different kind of understanding you have than if you don't do that stuff. So make peace with stitching stuff out. Lisa says that it's all about the test so... I, I am absolutely in the same boat, folks. All right, a couple last comments and we'll get gone, done here. Jarita says, love the Merrily Fonts and Ace One. Hey, I like Ace One. You've never seen me wear my own stuff before. This is the first time I've ever worn my own stuff because I actually really love Ace One and other kinds of Ace Fonts. You never know. But I love I love the concept of those fonts and envelopes. It's something that we do uniquely and in Brilliance that I'm really proud of. Um, DJ Kev says, thanks. I learned a lot from you. I feel like I'm advancing quicker than I ever would. Man, I'm so glad to hear that. That is why we're here. You can do what you want to do, and I'm here to help if I can. Uh, Cindy says, Brian, thank you for letting Eric go wild and crazy to practice designs for us. <laughs> yeah, I don't always ask for permission. I do ask for forgiveness, but every once in a while I make him something that sells a little bit. You never know. I try, but I will say this. Brian has been incredible at not only um, allowing me to go wild as he does, but supporting me, he has made features for me. And, and by the way, Merrily is something that he and I talked about when I first started working there and, and came to fruition later. And Ace was something that I went off on a wild tangent and showed him, I think our software can do something really cool that I don't think anybody else is doing. And he said, that's a thing that needs to be in the world. And he gave me the time and space to make it and then trusted me to put it out there. So it's really cool. So yeah, thanks to Brian for facilitating all of that. Uh, Frank says, very interesting episode. Uh, Cindy says, thanks. And Brian says, Cindy, you're welcome. It's super fun to work with Eric. Likewise, sir. It's <laughs> super fun to work with you too, man. And, and, and thank you. This is a product now that I use. I finally get to make my own hats. <laughs> uh, all right. And wonderful stuff to the client logo as a patch during class. Thanks, Eric. Love it. And thank you all for being here. All right. That was two hours. It's crazy. We did like a whole class, but you guys hung in there. Uh, you are champs. The thing I'm going to say is you guys are all ahead of the game because you want to know and you want to learn. Thank you for being here. What I'm going to say is if you haven't done patches, go out and try it. If you haven't done one of these methods, by all means, jump out and try these methods. None of it's particularly expensive, but it is absolutely uh, worthwhile to think about what is out there and to give it a shot and understand it below our lower jaw. Give it a try. So get out there, grab some materials, the little bit of investment you put in materials is worth immense amounts as it leads to the knowledge it takes for you to solve problems and make cool stuff. So get out there. Remember to live your life. These are the hours of life you got. Thank you for spending two of them with me. And I cannot wait to see you guys again next week.